participants and also the faculty. Now, this time we have a very burning topic that is COVID pandemic. And faculty is from the epicenter, New York, USA, Northwell Health. Uh, except one Dr. Dagubiti, who's coming from West Virginia University. And rest of the faculty is from North Health Health. They have total 14,000 cases experience during the pandemic in the New York. And uh, we, they will certainly, that will certainly help all of us to understand uh, the insight in the management of the COVID case basis. And also we will learn from them how to redeploy ourselves back to normal working and repatriate the whole scene in the hospital so that we go back to our normal routine. So uh, if you, uh, I will uh, I'll invite the first speaker and uh, First speaker, and first speaker is Dr. Ramesh Dagubiti. Dr. Dagubiti is a professor of medicine, associate chief of cardiology, and director of structural heart disease, West Virginia University, USA. He will enlighten us on pathophysiology of COVID-19. And may I now invite Dr. Dagubiti to deliver his talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Bang, and uh, for all our uh, uh, excellent uh, faculty from uh, Northwell Health. Um, so I just uh, wanted to let you know that uh, disclaimer is that uh, I'm neither an expert in uh, COVID-19, uh, but I think uh, all of us uh, have uh, a medical education uh, where we took care of several problems uh, without much of knowledge, or we have a lot of knowledge and we don't take care of uh, those diseases at all. So. As uh, Rajiv Jaha said, uh, either everyone is an expert or an, nobody is an expert in COVID-19. And uh, so I want to talk about actually pathophysiology of COVID-19 and let all our speakers then uh, 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 give specifications on how to treat this disease. So in the outline, we'll have coronavirus and the COVID-19 pandemic characteristics of COVID-19 and their pathophysiology. So the viruses, these are the smallest known infectious agents. They replicate in living cells, use the cellular machinery to synthesize new virus particles for the transfer of viral genomes to uninfected cells. So as you can see here, you know, the virus obligate intracellular pathogen, it usually influence the virus, for example, is 20 to 800 nanometers, which is very, very small. The coronaviruses are that uh, which are causing uh, uh, common colds, most of them. You know, so you, when you test for coronavirus, make sure you're doing COVID-19 and not the other ones. The two previous uh, recent outbreaks due to coronavirus is SARS 2002 to 2003 in Asia, uh, Korea as well. And about 8,000 cases and 800 deaths were reported uh, at that time. MERS, which has happened in 2012 to 2019 in Saudi Arabia and 27 other countries, about uh, 800 deaths and again, 2,500 total cases were reported. COVID-19 is an emerging viral disease due to a new strain, which is a SARS-CoV-2 strain. And uh, it is emerging in the sense that uh, what uh, China has seen, Italy, US, and now India and other countries are facing in the Far East. So the human coronaviruses, which are the common cold, and that's what we normally transmit from human to human, is uh, different types of strains, 229E, NL63, OC43, and HKU1. And so those are the human coronavirus common cold, which we always say the dictum is that uh, an untreated cold lasts for seven days or a treated cold lasts for one week. So whereas uh, the other ones, which are zoonosis and uh, this uh, uh, SARS-CoV-1, uh, came from a bat uh, to uh, mammals and then to human beings. And then uh, the MERS came to a camel and then to the human being. And we don't know what actually was uh, uh, the intermediary animal from bat to what else and before in Wuhan. 
that uh, caused actually transmission to human beings in SARS-CoV-2. So there are a lot of uh, uh, speculations about whether that virus came from, uh, as uh, you know, Wuhan has the uh, largest uh, virology lab, whether it came from that lab to the bats or uh, how it came, nobody knows. And, uh, you know, we are uh, scientists and we are physicians. We should uh, uh, think uh, with an open mind and treat it that, that there is a, a virus that came out from somewhere, uh, whether we don't know where and uh, don't make speculations. But uh, let's try to understand the disease and how we can cope up with the problem that we have. It has been declared as a global pandemic. It has been uh, uh, originated in Wuhan in Hubei province. I actually visited uh, this uh, uh, Wuhan uh, beautiful city in 2013, where they actually had plans up to 2050, how the city is going to look. Uh, and it was amazing. I did some uh, intervention, proctored some um, procedures there and came out uh, uh, safely. Uh, so we know that this COVID-19 is a zoonotic origin. The hypothesis uh, animals in Wuhan market, and as I said, that uh, doesn't matter. But now it is from person to person. Transmission has already started. And uh, and uh, by May 24th uh, this morning, when I looked up, there were uh, confirmed cases of more than 5.4 million and uh, 344,000 uh, uh, deaths and more than 213 countries or territories have already been affected. The ways of contagion is droplet infection. Uh, when somebody coughs or exhales, uh, that in, uh, the droplets can be uh, then uh, uh, let, lead to the other person getting infected. It can land on objects and surfaces around the person and they can remain, uh, uh, survive, uh, the virus can survive for several weeks even. And that is why it is most important to stay more than at least one meter away. So, but we make it uh, two meters to be on the safer side from a person who is sick. The incubation period is up to 14 uh, days. And uh, that is why our policy is when I traveled from New York to here, uh, we have to, uh, uh, when it was a hot spot, and uh, we had to uh, isolate ourselves for 14 days, nine days in, uh, uh, at home, and uh, five days with a mask, and the hospital is allowed. And so, because if we develop sickness, uh, we will know some symptoms, we will know by that time. And, uh, but most cases are occurring approximately four to five days after exposure. And as you heard that it actually just uh, happened in Delhi today, uh, or some really, uh, one of the gastroenterology surgeons uh, passed away after treating a perforated, uh, I think, uh, 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 appendix or something. And uh, I was doing surgery, even though he wore PPE, he died within three days from uh, uh, the treatment. So in, I think it looks like uh, this incubation period, it could be rapidly changing from uh, this uh, onset of infection to mortality in this person has been only three days. So the transmiss uh, transmissibility or the R0 factor is very important. It actually the basic reproduction number, how many people can one person in the society is likely to infect other people. So if the R0 is uh, more than one uh, case, the uh, numbers would increase. If it is zero, the case numbers are stable. If it R0 is less than one, that means the case numbers are decreasing. So it depends upon three factors, how long people are infectious, the probability of transmission per contact between susceptible and infected individuals, and the average rate of uh, such contacts. In Wuhan, the R0 is between two to three. In the uh, US, it was a 3.4. And uh, it changes, actually, as we say, that uh, you know, at the peak, it is right, really higher. And uh, so what it means is that a person who is infected can become asymptomatic or symptomatic. And I have heard in India just recently, uh, one of the I think chief ministers somewhere, and probably in Andhra Pradesh, uh, said that asymptomatic person cannot spread the disease to uh, to uh, other you know, people. That is not true. Asymptomatic person can become symptomatic, or he can spread the disease still. And it is uh, uh, can asymptomatic person can become a, a chronic infection, uh, and he can spread to other people, or he can completely recover. Similarly, the symptomatic person can actually recover or have some disability and or uh, and unfortunately die. So isolation, identification of the virus, obviously the picture on the left is really bad, no gloves are, are seen, so I think it is just a picture to show us. But on the right side, as you see, this is the microbiology labs where you need to really isolate the virus and, uh, and the sequence it. The, when they an analyze the genomic sequence of this coronavirus and, uh, and uh, electron microscope, and this is how we see this uh, different, uh, like a ball with several spikes, uh, almost like it remind, reminds me of a, a tennis ball where we put these spikes and uh, while playing cricket and uh, making sure that uh, you can have a nice uh, spin on the ball. 
So this uh, virus has uh, four uh, particles uh, or uh, four parts. The spike that is uh, called the spike protein, and that's why you see these triangular spikes. And next to it is the envelope uh, uh, segment, and then membrane and nucleocapsid. So these are all uh, ten kilobases of uh, proteins that are uh, seen on this uh, virus. So the detection is, uh, you know, from uh, uh, the gene detection to uh, direct uh, virus detection is about uh, uh, compared to what we now see is about uh, uh, nine uh, ninety minutes in our rapid detections. But uh, it used to take almost a week to two weeks in the beginning. And uh, you know, the other way to do is uh, you know, antibodies. Antibodies will take much longer from five day five to ten, and uh, for months to years you might have. And what it means, nobody knows. Uh, what does it mean if we have antibodies? We are still speculating that as well. So the detection is mainly by polymerase chain reaction, the PCR, uh, which you can see that you take a nasal swab, and I don't think that it's such a pleasant one. I don't. Uh, I have not had, but I had a, one of my nurse who had a, a nasal swab done, and uh, not like in this picture where the woman is laughing. Uh, almost tears were coming out of the uh, eyes because uh, the swab actually goes into your nasal pharynx, and it might help make you gag as well. But that is important to detect, and the polymerase chain reaction has helped us to detect this as uh, soon as possible. Now there is also a 15-minute rapid assay that has been used in most uh, places, at least in our uh, hospital. We are, have we take about. Uh, uh, 90 minutes or so. So antibodies are a trace of a previous infection. What it means, I said that actually people who have antibodies have given convalescent plasma. It might help uh, people to overcome or limit uh, uh, the severity of the infection that has been done, uh, that uh, they have uh, received. And uh, so we need to know how uh, these antibodies will help us in the future. And uh, so let's quickly look at the COVID-19 pathophysiology ever since it has been uh, reported in uh, uh, in, in uh, China, and uh, uh, we also found out that there's more D-dimer elevations. Uh, the platelets are not uh, that much changed. There's the lymphopenia, but the PTT is unchanged. And in February 19th, there have been much more reports of abnormal coagulation parameters are associated with the poor prognosis in patients with the novel coronavirus pneumonia. And then around in April 10 to 14th, then there was small vessel thrombi. I think uh, Dr. Puneet uh, Gandotra is going to touch on that. Uh, there is fibrin deposits in this uh, uh, endothelium, the uh, von Willebrand factor deposition as well. And uh, then later we also came to know that there's uh, not only venous thrombosis, but also large vessel thrombi have been in a higher uh, incidence in these patients. And very few patients have reported on April 28 that premature strokes are happening in younger people, uh, but well, that's a case series of five patients, but uh, three of them had other uh, risk factors such as hypertension and diabetes, which could explain the strokes in them. But uh, this is something that we have to keep a watch on. And I received several uh, uh, you know, messages either through WhatsApp or phone calls saying that uh, what is the prophylaxis for these patients? Should everybody to be, uh, to be taking uh, aspirin? Actually, my uh, recommendation is no. If you don't have any other risk factors for uh, uh, stroke or coronary artery disease prevention, uh, uh, secondary, you don't need to take aspirin to prevent the strokes from uh, uh, COVID-19. So how, what's the pathophysiology is, first of all, the virus enters through our, uh, the air that we breathe from a person who is infected uh, when he coughs, uh, when we come in contact, so the coronavirus enters into the uh, alveoli and it enters uh, uh, by actually attaching the spike protein, spike one and spike two, to the ACE2 uh, receptor. Uh, as you know, ACE is uh, 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 a receptor converts ACE1 to uh, ANG1 to ANG2, and uh, ACE2 converts uh, ANG2 to ANG1 to seven uh, particles. And uh, so uh, these uh, ACE2 receptors are then uh, through the viral particle and furin proteins, they enter into the endocytic uh, uh, vesicles and they get embedded into the endothelium as well. So that uh, said, uh, what main pathophysiology, as we know, is that uh, there is endothelial litis. There has been a couple of uh, uh, autopsy specimens done both uh, uh, at my previous institutions and uh, also in uh, China and uh, in, uh, in Cleveland as well. So all they found is there is not uh, much of uh, uh, acute uh, coronary occlusions in large thrombi, but there's been uh, endothelial litis. What actually happens is when the coronavirus enters into the alveolar cell, uh, right next to it is the endothelium, and the endothelium gets activated and uh, it uh, undergoes a uh, cell dysfunction. 
So because of uh, too many leukocytes are activated, it creates actually a, almost like a, a cytokine storm. And then they release proteases, which causes a neutrophil uh, elastase uh, catepsins, and uh, through which uh, the protease receptors are uh, 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 entangled into that. And uh, so it finally causes cell death, and the release of uh, danger signals are seen, and it causes ultimately hypoxia of the cell. So the consequences of this endothelial cell dysfunction is a loss of anticoagulant surface, uh, fibrin formation, uh, there's a von Willebrand factor release and deposition as well in the endothelial cell and the leukocyte the recruitment and complement activation. Ultimately, in this uh, uh, cytokine storm, as you can see, people who are diabetics are probably more prone to that. And, uh, you know, th these are all several uh, mechanisms uh, contributing to the increased susceptibility for coronavirus in patients uh, uh, with and without diabetes. The following aerosolized uptake of uh, coronavirus the invasion of respiratory epithelium and other target cells by the coronavirus 2 involves binding to surf, uh, cell surface and angiotensin converting enzyme uh, receptors. And increased expression of uh, ACE2 may favor more efficient cell binding and entry into the cells. The early recruitment and uh, function of neutrophils and macrophages are impaired uh, in, in, due to this disease. And uh, as you can see, impaired neutrophils and uh, impaired uh, uh, interferon uh, uh, gamma production from NK cells, macrophages, and uh, ACE2 expression and antigen presentation are all impaired. And that leads to a cyclo uh, cytokine storm resulting in cardiac dysfunction, renal injury, ARDS, and the systemic inflammation and uh, multi-organ failure. So COVID-19 and I think coagulation is something that is going to be covered later. So, I, but it, uh, in my opinion, it is not uh, actually a true, truly a coagulopathy, but the elevated coagulation factor levels, D-dimer, and the slightly prolonged the PT, APTTs, and the thrombocytopenia bleeding is rare. And it, there have been case reports, obviously, and uh, D-dimers associated with mortality. It's more of a thromboinflammation, and the uh, IL-6 levels co correlate with the fibrinogen levels. The severity of illness correlates with magnitude of coagulation changes. And ultimately, I think, uh, in my opinion, it is endotheliopathy or endotheliolitis. The normal protective function of endothelial cells are disrupted by direct viral infection. So can we target the endothelium to prevent thrombosis in COVID-19? These are so several other research uh, that is going on and the normalizing the endothelium by stimulating receptors that mediate uh, endothelial homeostasis. You know, activated protein C pathways like 3K3A, APC, paramodulins, and uh, type 2 pathways. And uh, the investigators are mentioned here, Samir Parik and uh, uh, Robert Flamman have they are doing these uh, studies. And the other one, uh, thought process is blocking endothelial thrombin generation. Maybe that is uh, also possible. This is uh, also you know, done by Jeff Zwicker and uh, from uh, Brigham. And interfering with complement cascade and the, the target generation of C5, which is, uh, I think, uh, eculizumab uh, has been uh, shown uh, in Italy, the uh, decrease in inflammatory markers. So I think uh, the presentation could vary from an infected person to either ICU, prolonged stay, and or death. So the clinical presentations, I think, are several, you know, fever, fatigue, dry cough is seen in most of the people, and the shortness of breath as, uh, as well. Uh, the, I think we covered this and the signs and symptoms of respiratory compromise. I think uh, Dr. Mangla is going to cover all of that. And, uh, uh, and mortality uh, is, uh, whether you look at case fatality is about 2%, but crude mortality can go up to even 6% due to COVID-19, uh, uh, which is currently what we see in, the, in the many of the places. So primarily infection control and prompt testing and presumption of COVID-19 contamination until the test proves negative, strict infection control measures to pr protect the patients and staff. And I think of what you might think uh, uh, that uh, you have a good PPE, maybe cover it up with the two layers. In China, at least I know my colleagues have used three layers of gowns on top of whatever they were wearing with the three uh, shoe covers and three masks and before going into a COVID-19 patient. Supportive measures is all we can actually give to the patients for, uh, for the time being, but I would like to hear from other uh, speakers as well about this. So lastly, essential elements in the healthcare system, we need to have adequate COVID-19 tests, adequate staff with appropriate training, and adequate protection for staff and patients, 
and an adequate number of beds. I know in Mumbai that has become a huge problem now to find uh, beds uh, uh, in uh, Mumbai and uh, adequate capacity to keep uh, treating other medical problems. Because although attention is focused on COVID people, don't stop getting sick for a, people don't stop getting sick for a variety of uh, uh, other reasons. Uh, so uh, please uh, do not uh, create a, a, a parallel pandemic where uh, maybe the acute MIs are uh, dying before they come into the hospital. I will stop with this and I'll be able to take answers at the end. Thank you very much. I think it's a brilliant presentation. Uh, without understanding the pathophysiology, it would be difficult for us to understand the cardiac involvement in the COVID-19. So it's a good background that is being created by a talk given by Dr. Ramesh Dagobiti. Brilliantly express all the concerns on this. And you are right, uh, Dr. Dagobiti. Currently, we do have an issue with the bed problem, though go government is uh, working very hard here in Maharashtra. And they have created a large number of uh, bed pools and even taken over all the private hospitals also. So 80% uh, beds are occupied by, in my hospital also, is by COVID patients. So it's a kind of a situation that uh, you're right, we are in, it's like a community spread presently. Every day in Mumbai, we are seeing 1,500 to 2,000 cases, new cases every day. So we are into community spread, at least in Mumbai. But as I said last time, for the benefit of those who are not there at the moment, I will say that again, that there are at least 300 districts in India, which are COVID free totally where uh, partial economic activity is on and government is slowly, slowly opening various kinds of uh, economic activity that those are possible. But essentials and medicines, uh, all are available. And fortunately, our recovery rate is very, very good. It's almost 41%. And the mortality rate, rate is also excellent, 3% around. So overall scenario looks good because of maybe a favorable demographics has helped us and also BCG, BCG because it's all uh, it's all cellular type of immunity that we need, lymphocytic immunity, which is very good uh, for for the patient, for the candidates who have received BCG in the childhood or who had uh, tuberculosis for some reason or other reason, and they have a good lymphocyte count. So thank you very much. Uh, questions will be at the end, and may I now ask invite the next speaker. And next speaker is Dr. Punit Gandotra. He is a chairman and director of cardiac catheterization laboratories at Southside Hospital, North Wealth Health, New York, USA. And Punit will enlighten us on diagnosis and management of hypercoagulable states in COVID, which is very, very important because we have learned that most of these patients do have a very high chance of coagulability. Now, can we have Dr. Punit Mandotra? Punit, can you yes. come up? Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Great, thank you everyone for the invite. Um, so as the, uh, our critical care doctors would say, uh, you know, they've uh, repatriated us to the, uh, the cardiologist to the world of, uh, of uh, intensive care. It's been quite interesting. Um, I personally will say that I've learned more than I've learned in a long time. Um, it's uh, been an amazing experience. It's been, uh, concerning. Uh, it's been worrisome, but I think all of us together have uh, gone through it and uh, it you know, really has been uh, a fantastic uh, ability to learn. So I'm going to start out with a patient as we always do, uh, or we always should. <clears throat> this was a patient who is uh, 40 years of age. Um, he presented to our hospital. Um, he actually was diagnosed with COVID um, about uh, four weeks prior. 
Um, he was hospitalized for two weeks, discharged to home, um, and then started having progressive symptoms of shortness of breath. In the emergency room, he's borderline hypotensive um, and his heart rate is in 110s. He's 87%, he's hypoxemic, uh, he's troponin negative, which is surprising, and his BNP was elevated. His platelets were low. Um, he uh, underwent a CT uh, 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 for looking for a PE and essentially was found to have a massive uh, clot uh, or thrombus in bilateral um, uh, regions and also as a saddle as well. Um, because of his uh, clinical factors, uh, we decided to bring him to the uh, cath lab. Initially, the thought was regarding a possibility of doing a TPA versus catheter-directed lysis um, because of his uh, essentially almost obstructive shock. But because of his platelets that were borderline, we decided to have him undergo thrombectomy. So this uh, initial uh, cine, you can see, of the left uh, pulmonary artery, and essentially, if you can see uh, that there's significant amount of thrombus in the left side, and there's really barely any flow. So this, this patient's in uh, obstructive shock based on uh, just visually, and of course, by numbers as well. And this is the right pulmonary artery. This is a pigtail catheter in the pulmonary artery, essentially looking at uh, the right side. And uh, what we decided to do in this patient uh, was to, and actually, as you saw, his uh, PA pressures were 64, his PA saturation was uh, 48%, his mixed venous. We decided to have him undergo uh, inari or thrombectomy, uh, which is one of the ways that we um, look at uh, doing these procedures. And there's few other devices that we use, but inari in this situation seemed to be the most appropriate considering that patient had significant amount of thrombus and it was proximal and those are the patients that actually benefit the most. This is our uh, successful thrombectomy, uh, and you can see the amount of thrombus uh, that was taken out uh, from this uh, patient's pulmonary artery. Um, and uh, we've done uh, quite a few other cases uh, that have presented with uh, um, thrombus um, or PEs um, that have been uh, clinically decompensating, uh, and uh, we've had very good success. Um, and this patient was discharged to home um, on uh, 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 no oxygen, actually. He did stay in the hospital for another uh, four days. Our usual length of stay after a PE procedure is 48 hours, but uh, he was longer just because of the amount of thrombus that this patient had. He was uh, treated with uh, PO, uh, DOAC, or NOAC as an outpatient. And this is the uh, final result on the right side. As you remember from the other images, um, there was a, a complete obstruction. And now uh, with this image, there is not. Another case, uh, we have a 65-year-old uh, female, oh, sorry, male uh, presented with the hypertension, uh, high diabetes, uh, has history of some cardiac disease in the past. Previous angio was non-obstructive, uh, presented to the hospital with uh, chest pressure, uh, you know, almost kind of a late presentation, myocardial infarction, his uh, EKG had uh, inferior ST elevations. And the, one of the interesting things here is that non-obstructive disease about a year prior and now presenting with a, a significant uh, um, thrombus burden. And this is uh, one of my partners who uh, did the image, uh, did the uh, uh, procedure. Uh, as you can see, laden with thrombus from uh, essentially from the top to the bottom of the uh, uh, vessel. Uh, quite a bit of work, um, you know, uh, anticoagulants uh, and and uh, and antiplatelets, and uh, overall um, very good result. And patient did well. And I think even even then, in the end, you can see that there is thrombus at the distal edge of the right coronary artery. And this, this is a theme that is going to be resonant throughout this whole time, that the amount and the degree of thrombus is tremendous. Um, it, this is not our typical uh, thrombotic burden that we see. Uh, I do a, a lot of uh, PE cases. Uh, obviously, we do a lot of STEMIs in this uh, system. It's rare that we see vessels like this. It's rare that we see the amount of thrombus uh, that we are seeing in the, 
in these in these patients. And now, is it just because of their late presentations? We don't know the answer to that. Uh, or is it just the degree of thrombus that's being produced? Uh, the inflammatory response is so significant that it is leading to a uh, large amount of clot. Another interesting case, I know Dr. 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 Dagobadi mentioned uh, regarding a patient, uh, regarding arterial thrombi as well. We certainly have seen uh, a, uh, a lot of uh, strokes as well in young patients. This is a 53-year-old uh, female, actually no uh, real risk factors, came into the hospital, was COVID positive, um, saturations were low, um, was on uh, a nasal, was placed on nasal cannula, non-rebreather. Um, uh, maybe a few days into her course, uh, she was uh, uh, she underwent a CAT scan because she had worsening hypoxemia and uh, clearly significant amount of uh, uh, pneumonia, as you can see on the left-sided images there uh, in the CAT scan. And then uh, one of the things that was noticed uh, was or she also had PEs. Um, one of the other things that was noticed was she actually had aortic thrombus as well. Um, and that filling defect pointed in the third image is uh, the aortic thrombus. And then you can actually see in uh, uh, the B and C uh, images as well, there's uh, aortic thrombus as well. And this patient actually had worsening hypoxemia, uh, and uh, um, uh, and the thought process was that this was secondary to her pulmonary emboli, um, uh, and most of the emboli were actually more distal. Uh, we decided to uh, give her TPA, um, a half dose, um, uh, based on some of the uh, other trial data that we have in the past, although not a great indication. Um, but we decided to do it for uh, to see if there would be any clinical improvement. And she actually did improve clinically um, uh, from a standpoint of hypoxemia. Interestingly, her repeat CAT scan that was done uh, prior to discharge did uh, show mild to moderate improvement in the aortic thrombus, but not significant, which was uh, a concern. Uh, we placed her on anticoagulants. I actually just saw her in the office about uh, two days ago, and uh, she's uh, on. Uh, oxygen at home, but walking, no evidence of any th uh, peripheral thrombus or, uh, or a stroke. All right, so uh, this is uh, a clearly a significant amount of coag coagulopathy. It's being deemed as uh, not DIC, but uh, COVID-associated coagulopathy, which is uh, a CAC. Um, the ferritin, fibrinogen, and D-dimer, there's significant elevation, and this is all essentially, uh, if you look at from a Virchow's triad standpoint, you have the hypercoagulable state, and you have venous stasis, and you know, all the things that are associated with it, you're essentially seeing, because the virus does uh, in, in, you know, integrate into the cell membranes. Um, there is prolongation of the PT and uh, PTT as well, mild uh, thrombocytosis or thrombocytopenia. We have seen patients with low platelets, as I showed you. I mean, this is happening almost kind of a late in the game uh, where our patients are almost recovering and then we're seeing uh, thrombocytopenia. Uh, the, uh, this is uh, looking at abnormal coagulation parameters and mortality. Uh, Clearly, if you have um, high, um, uh, uh, you know, PTT or D-dimers or fibrin degradation products, uh, the, the survival is poor. Uh, and I think that is one of the markers. And this, uh, what we're trying to do at this time is essentially every patient coming into the hospital uh, does receive most of these um, uh, tests. Um, from a, a lab work standpoint to help guide their therapy and then also they're, uh, um, they're looked at over time during their hospitalization. Uh, incidence of uh, uh, thromboembolism, uh, you clearly have in ICU patients a large uh, proportion of patients do end up having uh, uh, a, you know, thrombus. Now, diagnosing is obviously a challenge um, uh, because of limited resources and also trying to do minimal exposure. Uh, so that's been something that we've been uh, battling with or have battled with during this uh, 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 pandemic. 
So uh, during the hypercoagulable state, uh, you certainly have marked increase in the risk of uh, thromboemboli. And uh, as uh, Dr. Dagavari already mentioned, it's certainly increase in arterial thrombi as well. And <clears throat> you have ischemic strokes, myocardial infarction, uh, PEs, microvascular thrombosis. I'm not nece necessarily going to talk a lot about myocardial infarction because my partners are going to in the uh, next uh, few uh, presentations here. But certainly that's one of the concerns that we're uh, seeing that there's a lot of uh, microembolic uh, um, events that are occurring uh, and the patients are coming in with uh, myopathies. This is uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, case reports being uh, uh, you know, published regarding peripheral arterial disease um, in patients who are COVID positive, a lot of microemboli, and then certainly microvascular injury as well. And I think this is a, a, a concern um, based on the fact that <clears throat> even after the initial event or initial first week or two weeks, we're seeing these patients coming in with microvascular injury, uh, you know, three, four, five, uh, or even six weeks later. And that's uh, something that I don't think we've uh, seen in the past with other, uh, um, other uh, viruses. Management. Um, you know, I, I think uh, it's been a coin toss. Uh, you know, nobody really understands what's the right thing for these patients. Certainly, we know that uh, um, prophylaxis, uh, as we usually do for admitted uh, patients to the hospital, does help. Um, other than that, it's been a, a challenge trying to understand who would benefit from what. Um, indications for full dose of uh, heparin or anticoagulation. Um, certainly in documented or presumed, uh, uh, you know, thrombotic uh, uh, patient or for thrombus patients, meaning DVTs or PEs. If you're seeing clotting of intravascular access devices, that's certainly the case as well. Now, in critically ill patients, should you give it to everyone? Uh, and that's something that we've, uh, we've tried to do. Um, I don't know if that's the right answer. I think there's inadequate data. We know that, uh, you know, uh, we're trying different things. Now, does worsening clinical status, worsening hypoxemia, could that be the indication? Or worsening inflammatory markers? As I told you, we are checking inflammatory markers at, on admission and then later on as well. So should we be uh, basing our judgment for anticoagulation for those, uh, in those situations? Um, there's certainly a sepsis-induced coagulopathy, the SIC scores. And if you, if you look at some of the data coming out, um, if essentially this is the scoring system on the top right of the screen, and with high uh, SIC scores of greater than usually four, um, and if you look at heparin users versus heparin non-users, there clearly is um, an improved mortality or there is a mortality benefit in patients that are heparin users and high um, scores in addition to as you end up with high D-dimer levels and as you increase D-dimer levels in their five, six to eight fold, you certainly end up increasing um, the uh, mortality. So I, I think there is some evidence that if a patient is critically ill and they meet certain criteria, they should be started on anticoagulation. Now, you could easily argue that everybody should get it, but uh, clearly there is also uh, negative effects of anticoagulation, and we know that. You know, we have seen uh, brain bleeds and GI bleeds um, on uh, certain patients uh, during this uh, course of the pandemic. So I think that's certainly something has to be uh, carefully uh, done, and not everyone should have it as of yet. Um, this is our uh, HEP COVID uh, trial. Uh, this is something that we are actually starting to actively recruit. Uh, this is to answer the question that I just asked, which is which patients would benefit? And I think, uh, you know, uh, over the course of the next uh, six months to a year, perhaps we will have uh, adequate data to really answer the question that we are posing. And this uh, uh, trial will help in understanding that. The next uh, question is regarding TPA. Um, should a lot of these patients or some of these patients receive TPA? Um, we don't know the answer to that. And I think it, it, TPA is a, uh, is a medication that certainly can uh, have significant uh, detrimental effects. So we have to be cognizant of that and be careful in what we decide to do. 
Um, there is a three patient series and there's a few other series coming out uh, from, uh, from uh, China regarding uh, giving this to patients with worsening respiratory status. We ourselves uh, in our hospital uh, have an experience with about 15 patients uh, as we treated a, a few thousand. Um, and uh, these were given for suspected PE because of worsening uh, uh, status. What I will say is that, I mean, this is, uh, you know, so we're still reviewing the data, but uh, there's a, close to about 74, 75% mortality in those patients. And perhaps it was because of our selection bias of these patients. We chose the patients who were uh, headed uh, in the wrong direction and uh, we gave it to them and essentially they uh, died. Or is uh, TPA not necessarily beneficial for all of those microemboli and microthrombi that we're seeing? Uh, it, it's difficult to answer that question. Uh, so, uh, you know, the other things that we're seeing is right ventricular strain and right ventricular strain uh, could be a surrogate of a, a massive or a submassive PE. Should those patients be receiving uh, TPA? And that in itself, that data is starting to come through um, from multiple centers regarding usage of uh, uh, TPA versus increased uh, anticoagulation targets for those patients. So <clears throat> the bottom line here is... Uh, we, we don't know a lot about this disease. The amount of thrombus that we're seeing in these patients is tremendous. It's more than what we've seen in natural other settings. Um, and uh, the lack of data is still concerning, but I think on a daily basis, we have uh, new, um, uh, new ideas and new thoughts regarding treatment uh, of these patients. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Punit Madhutra. And it is a brilliant presentation that uh, you have displayed uh, case-based learning examples of pulmonary artery embolism uh, thrombosis where it was treated successfully. And also, some of those uh, peripheral artery thrombotic lesions were de depicted by you in some cases. It's a huge amount of personal experience that uh, you have displayed uh, and uh, used heparin in all those cases. And you found that the, those who are uh, benefited by heparin and non-benefited by heparin, those user and non-user, both least you have clearly depicted that heparin has a role to play in this patient, but TPA we are not sure. So excellent talk, and now may I invite the next uh, speaker, Dr. Mangala Nasiman. She is a regional director of critical care medicine, Northwell Health, Northwell Health, professor of medicine, Donald Barber Zucker School of Medicine, and Northwell Health. May I invite Dr. Mangala to start her talk on the topic uh, that is vent management is proning an option. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bang. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ventilation and COVID and how we've been uh, trying to ventilate these patients as best we can. Uh, hold on one second. Just going to. Uh, Unfreeze my screen one second. Okay. So how we do things in our ICU with these COVID patients who are extremely critically ill, the sickest patients that we have seen in a, in, in a long time, uh, we do our normal ICU protocols and uh, the DVT prophylaxis, we, you already heard a lot about. We do do uh, higher than normal DVT prophylaxis because of the uh, chance of thromboembolic events. We do uh, medical prophylaxis, venodynes, if they're not able to, and we have been using Pepsid, which is not our normal GI prophylaxis, because there is some evidence that the Pepsid molecule is very similar to COVID-19. And there is a trial right now that is underway with Pepsid as a, a treatment agent for COVID-19. So we've been using Pepsid as our primary GI prophylaxis for that reason. The labs that we've been checking are our normal labs. In addition to our normal labs, the CRP, the ferritin, the LDH are things that we've been following, as well as the troponin, as we've been seeing a lot of different uh, 
ways to follow these patients for severity and to see which direction they're going in. And we've been following the D-dimer, the LDH, the ferritin every three days just to see the prognosis of the patient, should we change our prophylaxis or not. Uh, and we do point of care exams to look at the LV and the RV almost on a daily basis as we are seeing the effects of high PEEP ventilation on the RV and the effects of the uh, cardiomyopathy on the LV. So we keep a close tab on that as well. And these patients that are extremely sick on high levels of PEEP. Our cannula, nasal cannula, we're targeting not hyperoxia, but somewhere between 90 and 96%, not more than that. Mm -hmm. And we start with a nasal cannula, obviously. And if they're requiring more than six or eight liters on that, we move on to a venturi mask or a non rebreather mask. And again, to target 90 to 95, no need for hyperoxia. If they continue to have low saturations, less than 88 or 86% with high work of breathing on the non rebreather, if we have high flow or non-invasive available, we try and do that. And if not, we go ahead and proceed to intubation and mechanical ventilation. Um, we have seen that these patients do better with earlier intubations and trying to prolong their uh, work of breathing uh, does, does make things worse overall. So we're trying not to wait too long to do the intubation on these patients. The initial vent settings, we tend to use uh, assist control, volume control mode, uh, or pressure control mode, and looking for an initial tidal volume, looking at ARDSNAP protocol of six to eight cc's per kg based on ideal body weight, not actual body weight. And again, the body weight table is here, which everyone has seen, and we really shoot for this target. We don't, we are really trying to do lung protective ventilation, not cause barotrauma, volume trauma, and not cause over distension of alveolar. We know that that causes long-term fibrosis. We've seen a lot of evidence of long-term fibrosis in these patients. So we really are trying to do lung protective from the very beginning. Uh, it's not always successful given high, how hypercapnic these patients can get, but as much as possible, uh, we're trying to do that. We're setting our initial rate to look for a baseline minute ventilation um, that is appropriate, not more than 36 breaths per minute. And this gives somewhere a rate between 16 and 24 breaths per minute. And we rapidly wean down the oxygen on the ventilator post intubation to shoot for somewhere between 90 and 92% uh, saturation. The effect of PEEP, PEEP we have found to be extremely effective uh, for COVID-19 and patients seem to be very PEEP sensitive. So we use our ultrasound machine to help us set the PEEP. We evaluate the RV as we're setting the PEEP. And the initial PEEP should depend on the body uh, habitus of the patient and the mechanics that you're seeing. If you're seeing very high peak and plateau pressures, you may have a difficult time with your PEEP, but if your BMI is less than 35, we start around 10. Between 35 and 50, a PEEP of 12, and greater than 50, we start with a PEEP of 15 and go from there. The PEEP, will tell you how your driving pressure is, which is extremely important. So the PEEP is a very crucial setting that we, we do initially on these patients. Our target goals are a PAO2 of somewhere between 55 and 80, and a plateau pressure less than 30. That's what we're aiming for on every single patient. Um, very hard to do on some of these COVID-19 patients that have become very stiff um, and their alveoli are immediately over distended. So you should take your time and really try to get that plateau down. Many of these patients will need paralytics and heavy sedation in order to achieve these goals and not to hurt their lungs. So don't be hesitant to do that as well. Our driving pressure, which is a plateau pressure minus our PEEP, is uh, we're shooting for a goal of 14 to 16. So if your plateau pressure is 30 and your PEEP is 10, already your driving pressure is 20. So you want to be very careful to adjust your peak to make that driving pressure uh, less than 16 or 14. Your pH goal allow for some permissive hypercapnia. If their pH is 7.3, they can tolerate that very well. There's no need to push a target pH that's completely normal. Permissive hypercapnia, mild respiratory acidosis will help uh, prevent you from going above tidal volumes between six and eight cc's per kg, which will help prevent barotrauma, volume trauma, and help uh, save those lungs for the future. Proning. Proning is something that uh, 
is completely widely used in COVID-19 in all of our hospitals, our community hospitals. Um, with very, it's very easy to do. It's non-invasive, and it can be done without any equipment whatsoever. We do early consideration of proning. Anyone who is mild to moderate to severe ARDS, we're doing it for. We're doing it for awake patients. So patients who are just on nasal cannulas, they're getting prone for several hours at a time. Uh, in our hospitals right now. And that has really prevented a lot of people from going on mechanical ventilation. So I highly suggest that proning awake patients with chest PT when you do that uh, is done anywhere you are. The earlier, the better with proning. And we start with a PF ratio somewhere below 150 is when we start thinking about proning patients. How long do we prone them? If they're intubated, we do 17 or 18 hours of proning with six or seven hours of supine ventilation. If they're not intubated, we do two or three hours of proning at a time and then flip them back over. That's about as much as they can tolerate uh, when they're awake and not intubated. The PF ratio is instantly improved. You can look, watch that saturation as you prone a patient, it immediately goes up and you buy lung, you buy uh, ventilation and you decrease VQ mismatching immediately. So proning is simple, easy. You can create proning teams in your hospitals and flip patients over awake, intubated, et cetera. If there's no improvement with proning, they likely don't have a lung disease that's responsive to proning. Maybe it's more volume overload. Maybe you're in the fibrotic phase already. Uh, they won't tolerate it well. Their hemodynamics go down. Um, in that case, immediately resume um, supine position. There are no real contraindications to proning, only spinal cord injury. If you have an open chest or an open abdomen, that's a contraindication. Otherwise, there's really no contraindications to proning, and it's very simple to do. Uh, we did awake proning on hundreds of patients in our health system. We're working on a manuscript now to uh, go over those results. And it really anecdotally seemed to pre prevent patients from progressing to intubation mechanical ventilation. It helped intubated patients improve their PO2s immediately. You can use less oxygen on the ventilator. You prevent hyperoxia and you improve um, damage to vent uh, your lungs. And... Uh, we created proning teams that went around bed to bed every hospital and uh, on a schedule, they were proning patients awake and intubated. Why does proning work? How does it work? So here is a, a diagram here, the normal, normal position of supine patient. You see all this lower lobe areas get atelectatic. They don't work well, they don't ventilate well. As soon as you flip those over, the lower lobes become the upper lobes, and you can see the difference in how open those areas are, and now the VQ mismatch is better. The lung volume you see is better. You're using more of your lung, and this improves mortality. What they think it's to um, tissue strain is decreased, and ventilator-associated lung injury also is decreased. So very quick, immediate effects, and really no down, downside whatsoever. These are some impressive CAT scans from Gatnoni. You can see the lower lobes in ARDS in this uh, upper left panel are completely down, densely consolidated. And as you flip the patient over and prone them in the lower panels, you can see that the lower lobes now are aerated. They look beautiful, open, they're ventilating again, your VQ mismatch is decreased, and it's a sustained effect. The effect, once you flip them back over and they become supine, the effect remains, and they um, continue to maintain better ventilation post-proning. So it helps maintain things. You only have to do this for a day or two or three in most patients, and you improve ventilation significantly. So my conclusions for ventilating COVID-19 patients, avoid hyperoxia, it hurts patients. Don't intubate if you don't need to. Try and prone them awake. Prone as often as you can and awake and intubated patients. Really, really try very hard to uh, do lung protective ventilation. Standard ARDS management is key. So trying not to hurt lungs using six to eight cc's per kg. Watching the plateau pressure and uh, not going too high and watching that driving pressure. Use sedation, use paralysis for very severely ill patients in very severe ARDS, and really be prepared for long ventilation times. Our average ventilation for these COVID-19 patients was around 19, 20 days. Our normal ventilation for normal ARDS is around four, five, six days, so much longer ventilation times for these patients, so be prepared for that. 
Watch out for secondary infections. Many of these patients are getting steroids and other things. So watch, watch out for um, ventilator-associated pneumonia, bacteremia, et cetera. And our weaning was done in a very standard way. So that's uh, my conclusions on uh, ventilation for uh, COVID-19. Thank you for allowing me to tell you about that. Absolutely brilliant talk. And uh, you have clearly depicted that the proning has a positive impact both in patients with, with the ventilator and without the ventilator. Yes. And clearly it uh, shows a very good impact after the proning. How did you uh, come to this point that proning is going to be beneficial while managing these patients? So we've been doing proning for a long time. There was a, a very good study about four or five years ago out of France, a multi-center study that showed a mortality benefit of about 36% from proning patients. That was a New England Journal of Medicine trial. So based upon that trial, we've been proning patients in ARDS for many years. Awake proning is a new thing that we started doing for COVID-19, just based on the fact that we had a shortage of ventilators and a shortage of ICU beds. So trying to prevent patients to going on ventilators and going in the ICU, we decided to try it on our awake patients who were going into ARDS and found a significant benefit for that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We have a more question and answer session after Great. all the talks Thank are you. over. Okay. Now let me go to the next speaker. And next speaker is Dr. Rajiv Johar. He is a vice chairman of Sandra Atlas Bass Heart Hospital, chief of cardiology at North Shore University Hospital, and associate professor of cardiology at Northwell School of Medicine, Northwell Health, New York, USA. He will enlighten us on where have the heart attacks have gone. That is the question we all are, all are asking every time. So it's worth learning from him. He is the man who was in the center of whole thing in the epicenter of whole thing. So let's hear from him what he has to say. Dr. Rajiv Chow. Dr. Rajiv Chow. Yeah, hi Vijay, I got it. Yeah. Vijay, thank you so much. Um, everyone in India and the world, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, you know, the COVID pandemic has taught us a lot of things. And uh, it also has, has taught us uh, to learn from our colleagues. You know, we learned a lot from our colleagues in, in, in Spain and Italy and China. And I think, you know, India now who's going through this uh, full force can learn from what we have experienced in, in, in New York. Um, it, it, it's, been a, it's been a humbling uh, experience for us. We've seen about 15,000 patients with COVID. But one thing we have seen is that the heart attacks went away, you know, and, and where did they go during these pandemics? Uh, you know, was it just all fear factor? Was it uh, something else? Clearly COVID does not cure heart disease. And we also know that, you know, the risk factors that are associated with heart disease portend a worse prognosis for patients with, um, with COVID. And so, hypertension, obesity, lack of exercise, diabetes, LV dysfunction, all portend a, a worse, worse prognosis uh, during these pandemics. You know, during our pandemics, we saw this, you know, a patient with ST elevations who would come in and uh, during a cardiac catheterization, we would find normal coronary arteries. This patient came in with essentially a normal ejection fraction that over the span of a, probably within an hour, his ejection fraction dramatically dropped um, and required, he had pericardial fusion, required a tap. And this was the sort of straw-like appearance of fluid that was removed from his pericardium. Unfortunately, he expired within 48 hours of, of despite uh, aggressive uh, therapies. So the reality was that patients were very afraid to come to the hospital. I mean, anecdotally, I, I noticed that my friends who would call me at night or patients who would call, uh, and I, I, I informed them to come to the emergency room. They refused to come uh, out of fear of, of COVID. And that fear uh, really uh, entered all facets of, of medicine. 
and and so you know uh, Harlan Krumholtz wrote this great piece in the in the New York Times in early April of where have all the heart attacks gone, and it was clear to us that we saw a dramatic dramatic decrease in in in, uh, in, in patients. We normally do several heart attacks, uh, uh, acute MIs a week. And all we were seeing were really uh, type two and no type one MIs. Um, thrombotic was, was very rare. Were they staying home? Were they having sudden death? Uh, we weren't sure. As Praneet showed us, this was what we, what we saw. We saw the hypercryoval, hyperthrombotic states. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we started in, in probably March, and so we're probably two months ahead of you in Mumbai. Um, and we peaked on April the 7th with 3,500 patients in the hospitals of Northwell Health with COVID positive. And what we noticed was that our peak date was April 7th, but our, and the peak date for sudden cardiac death in New York City at home was also April 7th. In other words, people were afraid to come to the hospital. This is a graph showing the normal sudden deaths by the New York City F Fire Department uh, EMS service, where they normally see about 30 uh, sudden deaths per day. During the COVID era in 2020, we peaked about 280. And this bell-shaped curve uh, worked along with what our volumes of, of COVID patients were. So it, it really went and worked in parallel with this and showed us that patients were clearly afraid of coming to the hospital. So we are, we, we are expecting that there were patients, patients had sudden death, arrhythmogenic foci, uh, probably had chest pain for a prolonged period of time, and then now we'll have LV dysfunction um, and the like. And this sort of showed, was born in our um, volumes, our cath volumes, uh, which we normally do in 2019 during a period of about a month and 10 days, about 1,100 cath procedures in our hospitals, in our two hospitals, we were down to 187 or about 83% reduction. So clearly there was a dramatic reduction in, in um, cardiac uh, management. And not just the inpatient stuff, the outpatient stuff, you know, and that was very important because I said earlier, risk factors play a role in, in, in uh, pretending a worse prognosis with cardiac disease, with COVID disease, sorry. So we really ramped up our telemedicine visits and now we're doing about three to 400 telemedicine visits per day. So this is a, a classic story of, of a 73 year old female who was home, started developing chest about 36 hours, 24 to 36 hours prior to coming to the emergency room. She refused to come in despite uh, her family uh, really pushing her to try to come to the hospital. Uh, you can see the, the, the classic Q waves, which we've seen a lot recently in these patients. And so she finally came to the emergency room and she was hypotensive and uh, was extremely short of breath and had difficulty breathing. Her labs were, were remarkable really for a, a high sensitive troponin of 1700, the BNP of 15,000. Those are dramatically elevated. And we've seen a lot of that recently in our patients. The time of symptom onset to presentations of the ED is significantly higher in 2020 during the COVID era than in 2019. And clearly that, that, that has played a role in, in worsening prognosis and sudden cardiac death at home. So this was her electrocardiogram, I mean, sorry, her coronary angiogram. And you can see a thrombotic LED lesion. Uh, but she was, her ventriculogram showed severe LV dysfunction with an injection fraction of 10 to 15%. She was hypotensive on pressors, got a balloon pump and a swan. And, and her ejection fraction on an echo done showed really an akinetic uh, anterior wall uh, that, that required, that we thought had already completed her infarct. She is now on, in, on her way to getting a viability study to see if there's any benefit to opening up that LED. We saw this a lot during the COVID era. And I suspect in, in Mumbai, you're going to see it a lot also. I, I know I, I read today that the, the time for patients to get to the ED is, is, is delayed because of the limited resources of ambulances and others, other, other things. And we're gonna see, unfortunately, a lot of sudden death as you hit the, uh, 
the peak of your uh, COVID crisis. What are the ramifications of late presentations? Well, you know, severe LV dysfunction. You know, the left left coronary system was fine, but when you have late presentation in someone and 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 the the thrombus is now uh, uh, formed and and it's very hard to uh, to remove and extract and is now organized despite aggressive therapies, extraction, uh, ballooning, uh, intracoronary medications, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, low, slow, slow flow states with our patients with uh, late presentation myocardial infarctions. And so despite our attempts to fix these vessels, it is becoming much harder in these patients who present very late in, in the presentation. This is a, a very interesting case of a, of a lady who really lived with her grandkids and started having angina. She had angina regularly. Uh, initially, it was every few minutes on, on, on exertion, but then it, it, it went to rest. She was popping nitroglycerin pills like they were going out of style. She was unable to play with the grandkids who she lived with. Uh, eventually, to the point where she finally came to the emergency room, uh, she had obviously had a closed circumflex graft. And after fixing this uh, last week, I had a telehealth visit with her on uh, Thursday and she's now playing with her grandkids and feels great. So it's imperative that we get out there to the community that heart disease and, and COVID crisis can go in parallel. It, COVID does not cure heart disease. If you're having symptoms, it is imperative that you get to the hospital before it's too late. We saw that surge in, in, in patients who had um, sudden death at home. We want to sort of minimize that in, in Mumbai and other parts of the world that have not seen the surge yet or the peak yet. So it is imperative that we educate the community. I think a mistake that we made in New York was that we did not learn from our colleagues in Spain, Italy, and in China. And so it's very important that in India, you learn uh, what to expect and how to handle it uh, going forward. You know, when you reinstitute procedures, you have to understand that there will be a certain fear factor that is not going to go away. And it will only go away with really education and communication, the creation of COVID-free space for the patients to feel safe, as well as the staff to feel safe, to really perform as many pre-procedure testing as you can, and obviously to provide the PPEs, which are, are of paramount importance in, in this situation. You know, our goal in New York is now to mitigate our second wave. Your goal in, in Mumbai and other places who have not seen the surge is to sort of flatten the curve as soon as possible. And, and, and in Mumbai, where you have everyone sitting on top of each other, like we did in New York City, the risk um, is extreme. So, you know, but there's a, there's a silver lining. This was our recovery space in our cath lab about uh, a month ago, which was Dr. Mangala uh, had controlled it with all COVID positive intubated patients. Last week, we got it back. And now we're, we're uh, bringing patients in for elective, urgent, emergent procedures. And so there is a hope at the end of the tunnel. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. And so I, I wish you, you all the best in Mumbai. Uh, and thank you very much for listening to my talk. very much dr Chahar. very nice talk and you depicted the case examples that you come across and it's a fear factor maybe which is responsible for seeing less number of uh, heart attacks in the hospitals maybe it is uh, that factor which is also playing very important role or yeah, i don't some think factor. i don't think there there's less heart attacks per se I think what is happening is that people are just staying home. And so, you know, unfortunately, there's sudden death. There's probably going to be a significant increase in ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, and that's going to be a problem for the next several months. Yeah, I understand this. Correct. Now, can we have a, we can, you know, next talk. Uh, next talk is by Dr. Avneet Singh who will enlighten us on 
on the only thing is a director of interventional cardiology associate director of cardiovascular fellowship program at long island Jewish medical center northwell health new york usa and he will enlighten us on PAMI and PCI in COVID era. We all know that how much it has changed uh, managing the cath lab. It's changed tremendously in COVID era. So he will enlighten us on the, this particular aspect. May I call upon Dr. Amnesty? Thank you, Dr. Singh. Good morning, everyone. All right. Uh, can you hear me, Dr. Bong? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Last perfect. time, uh, yes. Okay. Good morning. So we'll talk about PCI and acute MI in the COVID era. I think a lot of the talk that uh, the context has already been referred to, we know early from the experience from China and Italy that uh, there's a, a very significant interaction between how the virus and enters the body through the ACE receptors. And because of the cytokine storm and other inflammatory uh, states that set in, there's a significant interaction with the cardiovascular disease through the endothelial dysfunction, direct myocardial injury, and uh, leading to heart failure and heart arrhythmia. So we learned that early on in the game from other countries. And we also knew that uh, there were significant patients who had elevation of troponins and elevated troponins had a negative impact on their outcome. So what we noticed was that as the number of uh, patients with presented to the hospital with COVID were increasing, the number of acute MIs were decreasing. Now, this is how a cookbook PCI program looks like, that you have ambulance services set up to bring your patients in, you have reperfusion strategies set up, and you have evidence-based based care for these patients. However, in this era, none of this held true because we were never prepared uh, for managing cookbook cardiology in patients who had COVID. So the multiple issues came, starting with the system issues, diagnostic challenges, how do you revascularize these patients, whether you use PCI or fibrinolytic therapy, intra-procedural issues came, and how do we best prepare our Catholic personnel for their own safety and post-procedural outcomes, and what are the future implications? That's what we'll talk about. There were several algorithms that came from different societies for taking care of STEMI patients. And essentially the, uh, the common theme was that anyone who had uh, any symptoms of COVID, you have to risk stratify. And there was always a consideration whether you, you consider doing fibrinolytic therapy for these patients so that you can minimize the exposure to the cath lab staff and reserve high PCI for patients who are at high risk. Now, there are certain issues that come with this. We know that the PCI is definitely a better strategy for STEMI patients because of better uh, results with having a patent vessel and also reducing the risk of bleeding complications. And to extrapolate this, uh, that uh, the principles of PCI better than fibrinolytic therapy, we kept as a center theme for a simple reason. When a patient who's coming with uh, like a real STEMI to the hospital and they are having symptoms of acute mitral infarction, if you offer them fibrinolytic therapy to reperfuse, then you have like twofold problems. One is that you may not have the best result and at best you can have a 60% uh, efficacy in having the vessel open with fibrinolytic therapy. Secondly, then you have to consider keeping this patient in the hospital for cardiac cath or a pharma invasive strategy, and that may prolong their hospital uh, length of stay. So you're defeating your own uh, prophecy by uh, giving fibrinolytic therapy. And not only that, then there are also patients who may not have a typical SC elevation MI from a plaque rupture. And that's what we will, I'll show you um, a slide on that. So what did we learn? There were a couple of cases that came. Now, unfortunately, this is a data-free zone. There's no randomized trials to show. I know in cardiology, we are used to randomized trials, but this is all we know. Uh, this came out early uh, from New York that the patients who were coming to the hospital with ST elevations, not everyone had a plaque rupture causing an obstructive coronary artery disease. And in this paper by uh, Bangalore, 
you can tell that like there were patients who were taken to the cath lab and there were a significant number of patients who did not have any obstructive coronary artery disease, almost like to the of 40 percent. Patients were mostly treated with cardiac cath with uh, PCI as being the primary strategy. And this is concerning that there was significant mortality associated with it for patients who had SE elevations while uh, they were uh, COVID positive. Now, similar experience was, uh, was seen by uh, the, in Italy as well. Uh, what we see is that there's a wide spectrum of the age group of patients that were affected. And as you can tell, out of the 28 patient case series that they published, 11 of them did not have any obstructive coronary artery disease, but as yet they had ST elevations. So to say the SE elevation becomes very non-specific uh, sign on, uh, on presentation when these patients are coming with chest pain and which may sound like an acute coronary syndrome or an SE elevation MI strategy. And again, similar outcome that there was significant mortality associated in these patients. So I'll show you a case that I did uh, on Tuesday. So 68 year old female, she has history of DVTP in 2014. Not sure what the etiology was. She was on the Pixaban already, had COVID positive, tested two weeks prior, purely because she had household contact, but she was never really sick you know, by symptoms. Came with chest pain for 10 hours. She had chest pain all day, refused to come in because the fear factor, she did not want to be in the hospital. And this is her EKG. Now, there can be a lot of confusion as to whether the SC elevation is truly from plaque rupture type 1 MI or it could be something else like myopericoditis. So as a routine, we have implemented point of care echo in, in the cath lab and we did a point of care echo on this patient. And you can tell that this inferior lateral wall is hypokinetic and receptum is moving. So there was a localizing signs on the echocardiogram. So we decided that this patient is best off going to the cath lab because we were suspic suspicious that this one, this patient has obstructive coronary disease. And we found there was an obstructive, obstructive lesion in the proximal circumflex. The right was non-dominant, and this was a left dominant system. LV function is severely depressed, and there was severe MR. Now, this is something that is a, has been a common theme that all these patients who are coming in, it's just not a simple plaque rupture, vessels close, you open it up, we are finding a lot of patients with large amount of thrombus burden. And it, it makes uh, PCI challenging. And also the results may not be as gratifying. So as you can tell that we wired this lesion, the original area where the lesion was, you can tell that the whole lesion has shifted downwards because there was just an organized thrombus and it shifted downward and the distal vessel is closed. Now, just ballooning these lesions is not going to give you any result, no flow into the vessel. So extraction of the clot remains a key. Proper anticoagulation is absolutely important. We went with, with, the, with that strategy. We wired this lesion and did multiple runs of aspirational thrombectomy and got um, the vessel back. So it's a very large dominant left circumflex system. And did perform the uh, IVAS on this case at the end of the case. And we determined that there was non-obstructive stable plaque in the proximal vessel with no plaque rupture as being uh, the obvious culprit for the acute MI. So it looked like a thromboembolic event versus what it could be just mild endothelial injury from endothelitis, like Dr. Dagabati said, that led to in-situ thrombosis of the vessel. So what are the challenges in PCI in current stage? So there is definitely a delay in care. Whether that happens because the patients are scared to come in, there's lack of services available to pick up these patients to bring in a timely fashion, or it could be just misinformation. And as Dr. Johar pointed out, we did see a sudden increase in the cardiac arrest at home during this phase when uh, the epidemic was at, at its uh, peak in the uh, at New York area. Then there are delays in care that happen because every step of the way, whether it's the EMS picking up the patient, from the patient arriving in the ER, being screened for COVID, the staff putting on the PPEs, so that causes delay. And we know that delay in PCI is uh, associated with worse outcomes in patients who are having an acute MI. And that has led to some significant complications yes, that, that, that we were initially um, oblivious about because we, in the PCI era, we assume that everyone who has a STEMI, we reperfuse the vessel and we would not have any significant myocardial injury. 
But now we are seeing a significant uh, incidence of mechanical complications, and this has been like reported in several literatures over the last several weeks. The second challenge is what the STEMI mimickers, that not everyone who has a STEMI has a type 1 MI. For example, this was a case report that came out, and they found that this patient who had otherwise ST elevations by uh, EKG and symptoms did not have obstructive disease. They, uh, this patient had Takasubu, stress-induced myo, from the physical stress of being uh, uh, infected with COVID virus. And the third, or like a rather most challenging intra-procedural uh, thing that we see is the high thrombus burden. So how do we manage that? And obviously the antiplatelets is the centerpiece to treating all these patients, but then we have to start thinking of using high potent antiplatelets like Tigrelor or Presigrel. We also have to start thinking of IV Kangrelor to have instant platelet inhibition. Yeah, and we definitely saw there was a higher use of 2B3As. And I see thrombolytics has traditionally not been used, but the anecdotally in the New York area, those patient, patients who were having STEMIs were treated with isolytics because that was the only strategy that actually helped uh, re reproduce the vessel by lighting the clot. And using anticoagulants and in therapeutic doses, now, routine thrombectomy has been uh, deferred and just a class three indication to do it, but I can tell you that based on my own experience and looking around, this was used way more routinely than uh, we normally do because of the large thrombus burden. And post-procedurally, we have to always start thinking about the, the, with the DAP, with high potent agents, and co in combination with anticoagulants <laughs> like rivaroxaban, because we have some data from Atlas trials whether rivaroxaban can be helpful in ACS patients, so we've done that and a good and how about the outcomes? In cardiology, we are always too used to having good results, instant gratification, getting these patients out. But this is rather demoralizing when almost half of your patients, no matter what you do, die. And this was a similar experience that came out of New York as well. So this is, we are not used to this in cardiology and we had to make some adjustment morally to, um, to live with it. And last but not the least, all of us who work in teaching programs and we are trainees, and they definitely was uh, a decline in the volume of the cath app. People were repurposed to different areas. So the fellows suffered in their training as well. But every, every crisis, that is, there's a silver lining. For us, in this one, one thing that came out is that is robotic PCI the, the future for uh, performing PCI for these patients and definitely will help keeping six feet distant from the patient. So I think there's a learning curve to it, but definitely a possibility. So I think whatever we learned is based on case series, randomized trials and other pieces of information may come out in the future. We don't have that information yet, but I think at this point, sharing the information, sharing the knowledge of what we have learned is the best way to move forward and helps us keep taking care of these really, really sick patients in the best way that we can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amne Singh. Excellent presentation. And uh, of course, there is a paradigm shift in the approach to PAMI and PCI in the COVID era, and that is being depicted by Looks like there's a problem with uh, Dr. Bang's uh, audio. Uh, Rajiv, uh, would you like to be the next speaker? Yeah, I think there's a problem with Dr. Banks. Uh, Dr. Miraj, would you want to just share your slides? Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Sorry, very good. So, Dr. Pervez Miraj, he's Director of Interventional Cardiology at North Shore University Hospital, is really one of our uh, superstars in our program. And uh, he's going to talk to you about redeployment and repatriation. Thank you, Dr. Jahar, and uh, hopefully, Dr. Bang, we get you back in uh, technologically one piece. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation to give this talk. Uh, my topic is uh, esoteric 
and that it's redeployment and repatriation. However, it's an important topic that I think we can just have like a conversation about. So just wanted to let everybody know, and I know Dr. Doug Abadi mentioned the number of five point, almost 5.4 million people as of this morning uh, around the world, which uh, among the six plus billion people in the world doesn't seem like a, a, a huge percentage of the people, but this is just what we have confirmed. There are many more cases and, and we're all in different stages of the COVID pandemic. And I think it's important for us to see this. So in the United States, we are currently still not quite at the peak. We are getting there, but we're not quite at the peak. Uh, we, in the United States like to be number one in many things. This is probably not the one we should be number one in, uh, in terms of total number of cases, uh, highest among the world. In New York, you can see as a microcosm of New York of the United States, we started a little bit earlier and we peaked, um, and we're actually on their way on the on the curve downwards in terms of total numbers of cases. But as Dr. Jahar mentioned, and Dr. Singh mentioned, you know, we're we're looking to see when we may or may not have a second peak. But in India, and this is a very staggering graph, I think, for everybody to appreciate, you are quite on the rise uh, to the point where it do I don't see a peak. At, at, in sight right now. And uh, you are definitely a little behind us in terms of the case volumes, albeit your first case was around the same time as us in here in the United States, but it appears that the spread occurred a little bit later. This is all important to understand how we're gonna deal with this. And we dealt with this in, the, in New York with redeployment. So with the numbers of cases and number of patients coming in that require ICU care, require uh, internists to take care of these patients, whether it be in the ICU or pre-ICU, it's a very important piece that the staff and the workforce that's required to take care of these patients is immense. And it's unfortunately, it was at the point where it overwhelmed our normal internal medicine system as well as our normal critical care systems. Uh, we were creating ICUs out of areas that never saw routine patients. And it was very important to, to do this in order to take care of our patients most effectively. So we had cardiologists in the United States who were always considered the best internists, which is why we went into cardiology. This was uh, the pride that we all had. And so we were, we were always uh, a critical care heart. And so we, we were happy to join the workforce of the critical care physicians and under Dr. Mangala's uh, guidance. And we were able to hopefully do a reasonable job at taking care of these patients and helping out the team. Our cardiac volume, as we've discussed, as Dr. Jahar mentioned, where did all the heart attacks go? Well, they were probably staying at home, as he said, and so they weren't coming to the hospital. So our cardiology volume pretty much disappeared from the hospital. We had to have a concept of all hands on deck. And really, what I would suggest to everyone who's in the process of doing this is that we should all be an example for those around us, the rank, age, gender, none of that really matters. Only really immunocompromised patients are exempt from the, from the redeployment process because they're the ones who are likely to get the sickest. As those of us who took care of many of these patients and unfortunately, this disease does not care who you are and how young or old you are. It, if it's going to get you, it's going to get you. And the most, most, most important thing, as we have been in, in the U.S. and specifically at Northwell Health, been checking all of our antibody titers, we realized that the utilization of PPE and how effective PPE was uh, in the process was very important for us to, to see. So PPE, at least in, in our institution, appeared to have worked. Uh, we were using N95 masks, a mask, a double mask over it. Uh, caps, a face shield, uh, gowns, impenetrable gowns and gloves, and uh, we were doing the best we could. And it appears that that PPE level seemed to have worked in terms of getting us fewer and fewer hospital care or healthcare worker infections. In Europe, they actually had a position, patient, a position paper on how involved your epidemic you were and what you were able to do. So obviously, as, as part of our uh, impact on the healthcare system, we were very heavily impacted, as is India, and particularly Mumbai, is a, it seems to be very heavily impacted. And so when you're heavily impacted, you really have the inability to provide regular healthcare services. And I think this is where everybody who's not actively taking care of patients can be involved in helping taking care of some of these patients. And obviously, you must have enough people in the background. We mentioned STEMI cares, and obviously, the whole system of care changes uh, when we're in the middle of this. PPE is very important, and this is a specifically for the cath lab, but this applies to pretty much everywhere in the hospital. You must understand what PPE is, what the PPE was required, uh, and how effective it was. And we can tell you from New York, at least, that the PPE that we were using, which is pretty much this compendium of, of, of PPE, worked very well. Uh, it was not, nothing's 100%, but uh, it, it was a very effective uh, technique. So we were redeployed from pretty much the end of March through now. And now we're starting to become repatriated. And in the United States, the 
a multi-society document came out uh, earlier this month, and it discussed how and how we were going to restart and repatriate our cardiovascular services uh, back to where we were, where we are today. Every major society in North America it was involved in this. So probably one of the few times that I could say that all every president of every society was involved in in making some of these decisions. And this is just an overview of the process as to how we were going to phase in the reintroduction of invasive and non-invasive cardiovascular services back into the healthcare system. And it's very important to understand that the only time that we were able to start the conversation was when we were past the peak. As Dr. Jahar and Dr. Singh have mentioned, our peak was in uh, the early part of April. Uh, how our cases did not decrease that quickly. However, at this point now, we are starting to return our spaces that we normally were occupying prior to this with cardiovascular services with cardiovascular services. They're no longer COVID. And so at this point, we can now start opening our procedural and non-procedural areas slowly, but in a phased area, phased uh, introduction. And these are the phases, level one, level two, and level zero phased introduction. And you can see level zero will be back to regular normal services. We are nowhere near that point. We are starting just the beginning of level two services in, in our health system, and it's going to take a little bit of time. We don't know when our second surge is going to be, so we have to be very mindful of realizing what patients we bring to the hospital, how safe we make them, and as the others have mentioned on this call, how to, how to keep them comfortable. So as I showed in the picture earlier, the graph depicting that we're all on different points of the curve, and so obviously depending on where we are, for those of you in India and those of you in Mumbai specifically, obviously you're you're at, not even at the peak yet. So for you to come and open up regular, re reopen regular cardiovascular services would be a mistake uh, because the actual uh, impact of the COVID population in your hospitals is so great that the, there is no physical ability for you to be able to do that. Here in New York, we're starting to reopen things. We need to have direction from our local officials and we have to monitor for spikes in cases. This is very important because as soon as we start seeing more cases, which more likely than not, we all will see as other places in the world. And as someone else had mentioned earlier that I think Dr. Jahar mentioned that we need to learn from our colleagues across the world where other parts of the world have started to see increases in cases as we have reopened. It's important for us to keep an eye on that because we have to be able to flip the switch uh, back to closed if needed. Hopefully we don't, but if we needed, we have that ability. And it's very important that tracing and testing is very important because if you have a lot of patients or healthcare workers that start becoming infected, we need to be able to trace that. Otherwise we're getting in trouble. Obviously the repatriation of our services is different whether you're in the hospital or you're in the outpatient office. Uh, and we, without going into too much detail, it's obvious that the outpatient office is probably a safer environment because you're not having active COVID patients being treated. However, there are active COVID patients in the community that will be coming to the offices. So it's very important to be able to test or check to see if which patients had symptoms or which patients were COVID positive to be able to properly separate your immunocompromised patient from your COVID positive patient. We have to make sure that we have COVID free areas, as Dr. Jahar mentioned, because that's the only way that patients are gonna feel the confidence to come back to the hospital. This is a scary disease, and I think appropriately scary, and we have appropriately scared our patients. So now we have to make sure that we provide them with a safe environment. Social distancing is of key value of importance. We are not allowing visitors yet in all of our institutions, and I think this is very important. And as I mentioned earlier, PPE is of prime importance to be able to do all of this. Here in the U.S., we have a very inf uh, we have a very early nascent phase of telehealth, uh, mostly due to the fact that payments due to for pay telehealth were not really uh, covered for many for a long time due to the COVID era. That has changed significantly, and obviously telehealth has taken off. However, the infrastructure required for on both the patient and the provider side is not that great. So we need to improve the improve this this process. In India, I'm sure this is even more of it uh, more of an issue given a lack of uh, ubiquitous access to internet and high-speed internet access. So this is going to become uh, a, a very vital way to take care of patients as we move forward through this or any other future pandemic. However, the technological challenges are very, very, very valid. And I think it's, it's almost to the point where we need to start looking at more global uh, access to this kind of uh, information. Finally, the financial implications of this uh, of this COVID has been has been significant. I think this is not so much to complain that you know hospitals are losing money, but the reality of it is that this will potentially impact the way we provide care going forward, and it behooves us to be able to ensure that our care to our patients is not impacted in any significant way, uh, given the financial crisis that we're all facing. In all, in con in conclusion, I, I will I will leave everybody with this uh, thought that 
this is unlike anything we've ever seen before. This is something that hopefully we never see again. Unfortunately, that means no way for us to predict that. It will be some time before we go back to any semblance of normalcy that we see all saw before the COVID pandemic. We need all need to realize that we all need to band together, work together, and try to improve the outcomes of both our patients and ourselves. Safety is of absolute paramount importance, and so PPE should be on everyone's priority list for both the redeployment and the repatriation. And when we repatriate, we have to be intelligent, and we have to use common sense. This is a completely data-free zone. So anyone that says that we know exactly what we're doing is not telling you the truth. None of us really know what we're doing. We have a lot of experiences and we can share our experiences, but in the end, we are learning the best practices as we go on. Thank you very much. Pleasure for being here. Absolutely brilliant talk, Dr. Par Parvej Miraz. And uh, virtually you have opened up the window for redeployment and repatriation of routine services in cardiology. And um, although it's going to be a challenging situation, but I agree with you, this, this situation of a pandemic which was there in 1918, this is the worst, perhaps, and the more uh, cardiorespiratory. It's not only cardiothrombotic respiratory, cardiovascular, thrombotic, and respiratory, rather than just a respiratory syndrome, like SARS is a severe acute respiratory syndrome. It is not simple that. It's also cardiothrombotic. So in overall situation, it looks uh, more, more than an influenza virus, which has ravaged the whole world currently and created a huge, huge impact on, on the life and on the economy of the world. No doubt about that. And uh, there are plenty of questions that uh, are being asked. And the, the first question is Dr. Mangala Narsimhan. Where is she? Is she around? Mangala? I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Mangala, the question is, can you please explain the ventilator setting again? That's sure. The you want to do um, low tidal volume, 6 to 8 cc's per kg ideal body weight. You want to use as little oxygen as possible. And you want to increase PEEP um, to fix the driving pressure, which is the plateau minus the PEEP. You want to keep the plateau less than 30 and uh, try not to hurt the lungs. So that's the basic uh, ventilator settings. Okay, and the ARDS-like situation is not ARDS, but ARDS-like situation. So how do you, I mean, can you explain on that? So I think there's different phases of this disease. When they first come in, their lungs, the compliance is good and it's not a typical ARDS, but as the disease progresses and their lungs are injured more by the ventilator, it becomes a classic ARDS with very stiff, non-compliant lungs. So the, there's different phases of the ventilation as the disease progresses. I would treat it uh, with lung protective ventilation as much as possible so that you avoid the fibrotic phase of ARDS. What is your experience, those patients who have already received anticoagulant after they have come in, do they do, they do better in terms of lung problems? Because it, it is being told, it is being assumed that it's more of a thrombotic uh, capillary thrombosis in the lungs also. At yes, the level there, is, there, is, is, there is a subset of patients who have a very high D-dimer. And those patients we think have uh, some... Uh, lung thrombotic events. Um, some mortality autopsy studies have shown that it's not completely the way we think it is with microthrombi. But this subset of patients with very, very high D-dimers, we are anticoagulating those patients fully. But their studies are pending. We don't have the full answers yet, but uh, it's not every patient that's having thrombotic events. And it's not DIC also. So, I mean, it's not what, DIC. Way it is different, uh, what way it is different in terms of uh, med, uh, lab parameters? The platelets are not low initially for these patients. Um, and the uh, INR is not high. So it's not a classic DIC at all. It seems to be, um, if anything, a microthrombi type of event uh, in some subset of patients. Absolutely. Yeah. So do, do those patients who received anticoagulant early, as soon as they get, got admitted, do they better than the patient who have not received anticoagulant? Though Omni showed some slides, 
that those who received anticoagulant, uh, even Kunis showed some slide that those who received anticoagulant did better. I think the studies are ongoing on this right now. We have also seen lots of GI bleeding and death from, from uh, bleeding events. So I don't think that it's for every patient. I think the uh, we need further information to make those decisions. Correct. Uh, um, Puneet, can you just explain a little bit more about the anticoagulant? There are many questions on anticoagulant, basically. Certainly. So um, what we know so far um, is that there's really no defined strategy. You know, that's, I'm going to be honest about that. And so what we do know is that uh, patients who come in um, and have high um, scores or are critically ill based on certain criteria, if you take those patients versus the patients who do not have the high or uh, not critically ill, giving the patients with the uh, high uh, critically ill uh, in the, in a high critically ill setting, anticoagulation does benefit. That's all we know so far. Um, there's really nothing more than that. Now we have attempted to try to give anticoagulation, full anticoagulation to every single patient in our ICU. And as uh, Mangla mentioned, you know, we saw uh, a tremendous amount of bleeding as well. Uh, we saw GI bleeding, head bleeds, um, and of course, access site bleeding for after they've gotten procedures. So unfortunately, we don't have a definitive uh, idea exactly which subsets of patients benefit. I think there is an idea that the sickest patients with the highest SOFA scores and you know all the uh, uh, DIC scores and other things, those may benefit. Uh, but other than that, we don't know yet. Certainly, uh, a prophylaxis dosing uh, of anticoagulation is uh, beneficial and every pa admitted patient should get it, but not full dose anticoagulation as of yet. Did you, uh, did you maintain certain level of APTT? You know, we usually use our uh, protocols and uh, close to 50 to 60 uh, PTT uh, tends to be reasonable uh, in those patients. And there's another question that those who have thrombocytopenia, basically, and on, in those patients, can we consider recombinant thromboprotein as a therapy to increase their platelet count? I know there's some uh, a small amount of literature uh, regarding that, but uh, uh, we, ha we don't have any experience with that at this time. I mean, I think we obviously have to uh, consider the thrombotic uh, portion of this uh, uh, issue. If giving those recombinant uh, uh, um, uh, meds would actually increase the thrombotic burden uh, or concern for thrombosis. So uh, I personally at the uh, at Southside and uh, uh, don't know much about the rest of the health system as of yet. We don't have much experience. Okay, I mean the cytokine, Doctor Dagubeti. Yeah. Cytokine phase. Uh, what what do you find uh, in pathology? A little different than the patients who have not have a cytokine storm. Oh, yes. I mean, obviously, I think... Uh, so let me just answer the question that you asked, Puneet, about uh, thrombopoietin. Uh, there have been case reports of uh, where uh, thrombopoietin has been used. But uh, protocol actually is uh, below 10,000, give, give platelet transfusion. And also, you can use this FDA-approved drug, uh, from a bag uh, uh, for uh, people who have uh, uh, acute... Uh, 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 a plastic anemia or a chronic ITP with uh, severe uh, low counts such as less than 10,000. But all these, as we said, you know, nobody's an expert. As, as uh, Parve said, that uh, we are trying to learn uh, from one another and how to you know, tackle these patients. Uh, so people with uh, cytokine storm, that coming back to cytokine question, I think uh, obviously there is a huge... Uh, 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 cytokine release, which is uh, causing more inflammatory responses, and uh, people who have high cytokines in their uh, bloodstream, they do worse. Uh, I, I mean, how to tackle that is uh, still investigational. I think uh, uh, whether we should give all of them uh, some uh, high immune uh, responses, uh, what is probably trying to be achieving. 
uh, it would be nice to have somebody don't develop a cyclo, uh, cytokine storm. And uh, so we know people with high cytokines in their blood have high mortality. That's all we know for the time being. So which drug will uh, fare well? As uh, Italian series has shown, that maybe there will be some benefit in uh, uh, using uh, 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 the anti-cytokine drugs such as l You know, We have to still, it's all investigation. Good. Thank you very much, Dr. Mangala. Another question for you. Inhaling nitric oxide, does that help? We didn't use a lot of that. We used it in a subset of patients who had high pulmonary artery pressures that we thought had um, clots or, or pulmonary artery uh, thrombosis. Uh, we used it in that subset with big RVs, high PA pressures, but not every single patient. Dr. Rajiv Chawa, did you find, uh, did you, how many patients you think, uh, almost 40% you said, were found to be uh, having no, no thrombotic lesion or occlusive lesion in the coronary, despite having an infarct? So that's the natural 40% uh, recanalization rate is a natural one. So how does it different from uh, these patients? So that, these patients? That's, that's normal coronary arteries, right? This is, uh, even in the patients who recanalize with thrombolytics, they have a, usually have a lesion present. In these patients we saw with this focal myocarditis, they had essentially normal coronary arteries with no evidence of any um, uh, clot or thrombus uh, or plaque rupture. Okay, so maybe endothelitis, uh, like Dr. Dagobiti said. I think endothelitis is, is, a, is a major issue. Uh, you know, microthrombi is probably a major issue. I mean, but I think the most important thing we learned today is that we don't know. We just don't know. Uh, the differentiation between type, a, type 1 and type 2 becomes a challenge. Is that so? It's a huge challenge. I mean, you know, the reality is that, you know, you have to, the troponin levels can be elevated. And we know that troponin levels by itself portend a very poor prognosis. But the troponin levels do not, do not uh, tell us that the patient's having a type 1 MI. And so history and um, echocardiography play a huge role in the situation. How many uh, of the patient who died have died due to cardiovascular complication? Any data about it? You know, it's that's that's funny you ask. We, I was just uh, about half an hour ago, so I was texting with uh, Pervez Mirage. We we're working on a paper looking at all fourteen thousand of our COVID positive patients and their cardiac complications. So, stay tuned. We should have something published in the next few weeks. Yeah, the cause of death uh, could be cardiovascular. Uh, Involvement. Like I said in my talk, it's parallel. You know, you, you can't assume that just because you have COVID, that you can't have heart disease. People who have COVID have heart disease. People who, who have COVID, who have, uh, who are, who are, don't have COVID, but in the COVID era can still have heart disease. And so we have to accept that. Can the cytokine storm be predicted earlier by any test? Not that I know of. Any one of the panelists would like to uh, enlighten about on this subject, if any idea. At least I don't have any idea about any. I don't think uh, that predictive test knows. for the cytokine anyone storm. Can yeah, anyone but, can, no one can predict the cytokine storm. What yeah. we can predict, though, is that the patients who have risk factors, uh, they can have a worse prognosis. So a hypertensive patient, uh, a, a diabetic patient, a, may may obesity. A, obesity definitely. Yes, definitely. The so, problem, most of the data that's out there right now is that it's all associative. And I think that's, uh, that's, the biggest, that's the biggest concern, I think, with a lot of the papers that have been published. You know, uh, when you're, you're creating associations of, of outcomes of COVID, but they're not, they're not direct causality. So the problem is, is that we have a lot of theories. And I think a lot of the theories are important to use to, use to hopefully help enlighten us and, 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 and hopefully direct our care to some extent. But it's very hard to use any of the data that we have to create a predictive model. The model is very difficult to create. And I think that any of the papers that are out there that are talking about predictive models are, are very uh, basic. And I think it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to put your finger on it. So I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't hang your hat on anything. I think that's the, that's the, for those of you who are taking care of these patients, don't hang your hat on any one thing. It's looking at the big picture, looking at the patient as a whole and utilizing some of their baseline demographic risks to predict their outcomes rather than saying a test will predict their outcome. I don't think any tests are predicting anyone's outcomes right now. I agree. Okay. Is there a role of CRP or interleukin level which can predict the possibility of uh, impending cytokine storm? Well, CRP is very nonspecific, right? And, and, and these patients all yeah. have a very high inflammatory state, so it's hard to differentiate. Interleukin level? Predict. No. So Inter we, we, we used a rise in CRP greater than 30 um, or a ferritin over 1,000 to predict who was going to go into cytokine storm. But it's... Um, the interleukin levels, they were not they were not consistent even in those patients that were in cytokine storm. And D dimer? D dimers in a subset of patients, but a lot of patients who were in cytokine storm, all of those were elevated, and sometimes the D dimer was not. So uh, I think the ferritin and the CRP are more predictive than the D dimer. Yeah, that they are heading towards, particularly yes. when the ferritin levels are very high. Yes. That's yes. when you can predict that there may be cytokine storm, it's impending. Right. Okay, that's nice. And uh, now going on a repatriation, uh, can you a little bit more enlighten about the repatriating process? Uh, how do you plan to repatriate in your center? Even same question I would like to know from uh, Dr. Dagubiti because he's from another center. I think the I think the answer is it depends on your institution. So uh, for we will tell you what we did at our institution, and it'll be very different than Doc, Dr. Dagobati's answer. And I think it's there's no right answer. The answer has to be tailored to your institution. Uh, so for us, when our when our access to our health system infrastructure became available, which is a fancy way of saying when we had our space back. Uh, we were able to start considering opening up our cardiovascular services. So, uh, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll specify the cath lab. So when we got our recovery room and our, our initial intake area back, we started, we started opening the process up by phases. And so we had a four-phase process. Phase four patients we were always taking care of, which were the emergent patients, the STEMIs, the cardiogenic shocks. We never stopped taking care of those patients. But phase three patients were the high-risk stress tests, the persistent angina patients, the ones that were refractory angina to medical therapy. So we're currently on the phase three uh, process. Uh, we have not passed phase three yet. There are still two more phases. Phase two being the lower risk stress tests and the patients that are reasonably well controlled on anti-anginal therapy, however, not completely well controlled on anti-anginal therapy. And obviously phase one are the stable patients who are going in for stable, stable uh, valvular heart disease or, or what have you, or heart failure patients that require a routine uh, right heart cast or, or something to that effect, nothing that would uh, immediately impact their care. So that's really the, the, the phased process that we're using throughout the different uh, areas of cardiology. It's going to depend on where you are, and it's obviously going to be needing to be tracked moving forward so that you can maintain uh, a COVID-free area, because if the COVID patients start coming back, for if uh, there's a re-spike in the COVID patients, that all has to be uh, reconsidered and, and rethought out. Absolutely. Dr. Dagobit? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, almost nine weeks ago, when uh, New York is uh, starting to see the rise of uh, uh, COVID-19, we immediately went into a the hospital here, uh, even though we don't have that many number of patients, uh, we didn't uh, have any reported uh, patient in West Virginia. Uh, so we started preparing ourselves. We completely closed down all elective procedures. Uh, we converted about 100 rooms to negative pressure rooms. And uh, no visitation policy has been implemented. And uh, I actually wanted to go and help out in New York in my previous institution, but I uh, was asked not to do that. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, so we to, to, to do some policing work, you know, how we did policing work is that all electives were stopped, all non-emergent patients were stopped, only emergency procedures were being done, and those have to be approved uh, through me uh, in the entire uh, CAT and EP labs, and, uh, uh, and the admissions, obviously, we can't stop them, so, but no visitors and visitors in any of the rooms. And uh, the workforce has been sent home with the 
uh, the nursing and the te technologists for which the 75 percent uh, of pay and uh, people whom we could use uh, we did use them in other areas so sometimes it could be a cat lab nurse uh, working in uh, emergency room and vice versa and uh, uh, so I think uh, once uh, we saw that we would, did not have any increased uh, number of uh, patients, and even as of yesterday, we had a total of uh, 72 deaths in the entire West Virginia state, which is a small state, a population of only 2 million people. And uh, so we started uh, doing some uh, uh, emergencies. Uh, at that time, we were still continuing to do TAVERS because those patients who were symptomatic uh, TAVERS, we did continue. And we thought we may have to stop that as well if uh, we see increasing number of uh, patients uh, very soon. We didn't, uh, unfortunately, didn't see that. So then we started taking patients on stable angina uh, uh, and also uh, markedly abnormal stress tests. And now we started doing actually all elective procedures such as uh, even PF closures. So those are the type of phase uh, uh, approach that we also followed as uh, New York did, but uh, probably just because nobody wants to come to West Virginia, even the virus shied away from coming here, which we are happy about. All right. How about the outdoor? Ramesh, Dr. Dagobeti, how about the outdoor? So outdoors, I mean, similarly, just uh, like the hospital, no uh, restaurants are open even now, now except uh, maybe last week, we opened up a couple of uh, restaurants with patio seating, our dean is actually the advisor for the entire state. Uh, he is the czar for COVID-19, uh, sitting with the governor. And uh, whatever he tells, the governor, uh, and the governor follows that. And uh, masks are uh, implemented in everyone entering into the hospital. I'm in my office, so I can, uh, don't have to wear a mask now. But if I go out of my office, I have to wear a mask. And uh, that is the same policy at least we are trying to say that maybe 60 to 70 percent uh, of the people, if they wear masks, they can limit the transmission in the entire state. And uh, uh, even uh, grocery stores, and uh, many of them were closed completely, including hair salons and everything. And uh, uh, now they're gradually opening up, but uh, with a lot of uh, care. I mean, uh, you, we should see the restaurants, how they clean the tables, and almost like completely chlorinated. And I don't know whether that's uh, going to be causing any harm to the lungs. On the long run, probably Dr. Mangla can talk about that. And the spraying chlorine on everybody and everything nowadays, I don't know how it will affect in the future, but for the time being, that's what is being done. And, uh, yeah, you know, we don't have uh, many visitors coming into even grocery stores. Not You see only one or two people going around shopping, not in huge families uh, together. I, 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 last time also I mentioned this, that those uh, patients, when the patient come, if we provide a surgical mask, three-layer surgical mask to the patient properly, and the, uh, the doctor attending wears the N95 mask, then chance of transmission is 1.5% only. This is something struck my mind, and I thought this will be this should be brought out so that in case some people want to try this technique in running the OPD, that at least provide a surgical mask to the patient and, uh, and the cardiologist should wear an 95 mask in the hospital setting or in the chamber, private chamber, whatever. And uh, another thing is how do you manage the OPD? Dr. Rajiv Jor, OPD, OPD part. Well, we're doing a lot of our stuff with telehealth. And so we're using telehealth in as many patients as possible uh, because patients are still fearful of coming to the office. Uh, we are scheduling patients only two per hour who cannot do telehealth or need to come to the office. In the early phases of, of uh, the pandemic, we had just patients, we just had one doctor do emergency visits like an urgent care setting but now we're starting to open up the offices um, for two per day, two per hour, so we maintain social distancing. Okay, so I mean less appointments in the yes. cl clinic, so that clinic um, waiting area is not crowded with too many patients. Right. To maintain social distancing. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so it's a kind of a challenge for everybody now to return to the work. 
OPD and the indoor work, and both have really imposed a huge challenge while the whole crisis is going on, and we don't know what way it is heading. Uh, even you know, after the community spread, people are talking about the spread after the community spread. So uh, whatever you want to call that, it's a second infection, second infection coming up after the community spread is over. As, as soon as we resume back to work and uh, lockdown is open and everybody's moving around, the second phase or second uh, pandemic may come. Is that the fear? Do you carry that fear, Ajito, Dr. Jachicho? Definitely. I mean, look, the surge we saw from our colleagues in Italy and we're seeing from other states also that the second surge is, is likely going to come. Our, our job is to mitigate it. Our job is to flatten that curve. You know, we saw that the second surge in the Spanish pandemic was worse than the first surge. We hope that's not going to happen um, with this time. Yeah, I mean, so we have to have, a, we have to learn from the previous uh, pandemic and take enough precautions so that we don't land into a second surge. I would like to share my screen just to, you know, depict certain information, which is, uh, uh, which is in terms of, uh, this is a slide which uh, shows the anticoagulation regimen with low molecular weight heparin based on D-dimer level and the weight of the patient. And this study is uh, presented in Lancet, and this is from Imperial College of Healthcare London, uh, the NHS uh, hospital. And they recommended the anoxopyrin single dose of 40 milligram for all the patient if D-dimer is less than 1,000. And then uh, that is one. Second, if the weight is 100 and 150 kg, anoxaparin 40 BD. And weight more than 150 kg, anoxaparin 60 milligram BD. But if the D dimer levels are 1000 to 3000, less than weight less than 100 kg, anoxaparin 40 BD, is the uh, almost doses are doubled. 100 to 150 milligram anoxopyrin 80 milligram BD and more than 150 milligram anoxopyrin 120 milligram BD. And if the D-dimer level is more than 3000, then tinsapyrin based on the weight of the patient, 175 units per kg, once a daily dose. And this regimen seems to be effective and reduce the overall the thrombotic uh, episodes in the patients. So this seems to be very interesting part of uh, the, that uh, in Northwell you use the heparin, which also is a very good option, but even low molecular weight heparin is also a very good option and bleeding rates are less with the low molecular weight, uh, weight heparin as compared to the heparin. But heparin has an antidote uh, so in both ways, we can argue and say both have good enough role to play. Now, uh, before I go on to any further questions, I will just highlight uh, the recent development in terms of the hope that we can look is hope for the cure for this disease is having a vaccine. And the current status of the vaccine is uh, WHO has said that 100, more than 100 vaccines are under development globally. Currently, seven vaccines have reached human trial. Moderna is the, is the company from USA based in Boston. And this is the first company to release interim first phase report data in which they have healthy individual, 45 uh, healthy individual were divided into three groups of 15 each. 
and three different doses were attempted on each group, 25 microgram, 100 microgram, and 250 microgram, respectively using mRNA-1273 of COVID-19 virus. Vaccine produced antibodies against COVID in all 45 patients. Each participant received two doses of vaccine intramuscularly, approximately 20 days apart. Eight days, eight patients produced the antibody neutralizing COVID-19. Out of these eight, four were four received 25 milli microgram and balance four received 100 microgram dose. And data from the 250 microgram dose is yet not available. Vaccine was generally well, generally tolerated well and found to be safe. But there is notable side effect noticed with 250 microgram after the second dose. Three participants developed grade three systemic symptoms. The vaccine was tested in males and non-pregnant females between the ages of 18 to 55 healthy individuals. Management has amended the dose in second phase. They are going to go into second phase of the trial in which the 25 microgram dose, which was there in the first phase, is increased to 50 microgram and 100 microgram. And then, then there is a placebo added and number of patients 600 in this cohort. And this chief medical officer of Moderna, Dr. Tal Chak, said that the neutralizing antibodies substantiate the belief that mRNA-1273 has a potential to prevent COVID-19 disease when combined with success in preventing viral replications in the lungs at a preclinical challenge model at the dose that elucidated similar levels of neutralizing antibodies, which helped them double the dose of PURTAL trial. All the participants were zero converted by 15 days after the single dose. This is a very important information. Antibodies were comparable to the antibodies of convalescent patient of COVID-19. And the single dose of 100 microgram achieved the NAP titers similar to convalescent serum. And vaccination with mRNA-12773 elicited this immune response. Phase two trial will begin with 600 patients, as I suggested, 50 and 100 microgram dose, and 600 patients will be included. And phase three trial will begin in somewhere in July, and vaccine would be ready to market early in 2021. Moderna is the American biotechnology company based in Cambridge, MA. You will be surprised to know that the, the biggest vaccine producer in the world is India. There is an Indian uh, virology laboratory in Pune, which, has, which is, which is uh, located in 110 acres area. At, and every patient, every third uh, out of the three patients receive vaccine anywhere in the world. Two doses are produced in this lab. So this lab will work very hard and they have a direct collaboration with the US uh, counterparts and UK counterparts. There are other six trials which are ongoing and Oxford University trial, the animal results were very encouraging, but the, but the, but the human trials suggest uh, uh, not that encouraging report so far. So Oxford University uh, uh, vaccine, which is in the process, is still, uh, you know, not reached that peak. They have combined adeno, adenovirus with the, some part of the COVID-19. Then China is, uh, they are awaiting the human trial uh, result. Then Pfizer has, uh, from Germany, has collaborated with USA, and they want to give this vaccine to 8,000 individual. Out of that 360, they are already given in Germany in different doses, and the results are still awaited because they have to wait for uh, a stipulated time before they can, you know, study the uh, antibody titer and decide about the efficacy of the vaccine. The Novavax vaccine 
is also under trial. And uh, although this is again from USA, but trial will be done on 130 individual. It's already going on in Australia, healthy individual in Australia. Then British cigarette giant, giant company also has is involved in the and got the approval to start the human trial. Uh, soon they will start the human trial also. Then there is another American company, Ionovio, developing DNA-based vaccine. Animal results are promising. Company has already begun trials of first phase for T healthy individual with two doses of vaccine named Iono4880 vaccine. And shots were given four weeks apart Results are expected by June 8th. So keep the hope alive. That's the, that's the kind of um, sentiment uh, that we all need to carry at this stage. And uh, so that we learn about uh, this vaccine. And there are several drugs which are under trial, phase one, phase two, phase three trial. And remdesivir is particularly the one drug which is tried, which is under trial on thousands of patients uh, in various centers and seems to be effective, promising in early reports, uh, but doesn't, does not reduce the mortality. Next comes is a favapiravir from, it's oral, uh, remdesivir is an IV dose which is given 200 on first day, 200 milligram on the first day, and then 100 milligram every day for nine days IV, single dose. Then favapiravir is 200 milligram tablet. This is a Japanese study which has recommended favapiravir. They use favapiravir in Japan. If you start it in early stage of the COVID, uh, maybe in esopharyngeal phase, uh, then the results are very, very promising of the favipiravir and there is a trial going on in India uh, and uh, a pharmaceutical company called Stride Pharma doing a trial in India, 360 individuals are already given favipiravir in the doses uh, that are recommended are 200 milligram tablet, eight BD for the first day and then three BD for 13 days. So total 14 days course. And the third drug that is being that is being tried in Bangladesh. It's called as ivermectin in the doses of 150 to 200 microgram per kg body weight. And uh, it's also in a single dose. And drug seems to be very effective, a 60 patient study. All 60 patients recovered. So there are several other trials which are going on with the hydroxychloroquine, Azithromycin in combination. There is a French study which has said that uh, it works, and many patients have recovered on this. And India regimen at the moment is mainly a combination of uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And in severe cases, uh, steroids are used with uh, maybe convalescent plasma, is also tried in some patients in India also. And result came out well. The interleukin level uh, and the CRP level came down very rapidly, as it was seen in uh, Italian patient, five patients who were given convalescent plasma. So there is a lot of progress in a short time of two months in terms of trial. There is a Lancet has presented 60,000 patient trial conducted in all six continents of the world. And all these patients were given SCQ, and trial was under the control of Dr. Mandeep uh, Mehra from Harvard Medical School, and uh, seems to be not very effective in the trial. So it's a very large registry uh, and very stringently conducted registry, so I have a practice impacting effect. But looking at the combination of uh, SCQ and azithromycin given in India to all the patient with recovery rate of 41% and mortality rate of 3%, it looks like in India it works also in dengue, in chikungunya, and also it is working here in, on uh, patients with uh, COVID-19. 
So to begin with, uh, I thought uh, this is an even our mortality rate is one of the lowest in uh, in in the world, and of course uh, the what we did is a lockdown, which was stringency index was hundred as compared to the America, UK, and Spain and Sp uh, Spain and Italy there uh, and Germany for that matter. There the stringency index of lockdown was a little lower, not up to 100% was 60 or 70%. And that's where the peak has occurred very fast. And in India peak is very slow. So it gave time for India to prepare for uh, this pandemic, uh, the community spread in terms of uh, the PPE, the number of beds, the ventilators, because there were several challenges that existed and uh, that required some kind of uh, preparation and uh, now I think the uh, situation is a lot better. A lot of uh, beds are created. And the um, situation, uh, I think uh, the, the pandemic will peak somewhere in June, July. That's what most people are talking. I'm talking of a statistician, not the common people, that it will peak somewhere in July. At the moment, we see five, 6,000 patients per day in India. And when it peaks, I don't know what level will it be. But there are a lot of patients who are young in India, demographics is very favorable. So that may also uh, is giving perhaps a better impact. Plus most patients uh, have received BCG vaccine in India. So their lymphocyte count is very high. And it is told that it's the mainly cellul cellular immunity, which is important in COVID patient. If you have a good lymphocyte count, then you have a high chance of having a good immunity against this COVID virus. So uh, overall, I think this is a scenario that uh, I thought I will give a feed in. Uh, we don't know uh, the situation in terms of cardiac involvement that much in India at the moment, but certainly there, are, there is overall reduction in STEMI cases in India. And cath lab work has come down practically to you know, very few cases in a month, hardly any cases. Like we used to do uh, several cases now, hardly any cases in a month. And the uh, scenario is a lot different. And uh, definitely there is a paradigm shift in terms of uh, all this, uh, in, uh, all this uh, management in the cardiac, of cardiac patient in the COVID era. Uh, where are the other panelists? Are they there? Are... We're all here. I'm here. Oh, OK, all right. So I couldn't. So I couldn't see. So I thought, uh, am I missing you? So um, I thought uh, this is something which uh, we need to look at. And uh, any point, any one of you would like to highlight and add, which we missed out on overall question and session or uh, in the discussion or in presentation. I think several questions have come about hydroxychloroquine. I think this is a question that we always uh, uh, hear. There is a controversy. Right. I, I mean, no, more than a controversy, I think there's a large study that actually came out and showed that uh, there's no real benefit of that. In fact, the cardiac involvement was found in many, many, many patients. Right. In that registry. The counterpoint for that is uh, what about uh, so many people with rheumatoid arthritis have been or uh, lupus or whatever it is, they have been taking uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine, they never had any problems, so why should uh, we not take it, you know, <laughs> it's up to you, you know, I wouldn't yeah. recommend it, we don't. You know, ICMR here, Indian Council of Medical Research, they have recommended for the health worker prophylactic uh, Chloro hydroxychloroquine, 400 BD in, on the first day and then 200 OD every week. So many patients, many healthy doctors or healthcare workers are taking this uh, uh, particular regimen in prophylaxis. Uh, although this is an empirical recommendation, there is no proper study which, which can be based but uh, certainly it works uh, as antiviral, the SCQ works as antiviral uh, in our dengue patient and a chikungunya patient. And it is working, it seems it's working here because 
more than 125000 patients have received scq in my to best of my knowledge along with the azithromycin and they are doing well and at the moment have you got any experience with uh, tocilizumab uh, any one of you uh, have any experience the immunomodulator we we gave a lot of tocilizumab to patients who looked like they were going into cytokine storm with the high ferritin and the high crp but we are definitely seeing some complications of that a lot of bacterial um, bacteremia and also a lot of bowel perforations and patients who got tocilizumab much more than we normally see in the icu uh, so that is definitely uh, not something to be given to everybody, but something um, to be given to the right patient. We think it helps stop cytokine storm, but also created other problems. Okay. Do you do HRCT for all cases uh, in New York? No. No, not all cases. No. Whereas here the recommendation has come from various studies uh, that are done that if you, uh, because the uh, PCR sensitivity is low, and uh, knowing that PCR sensitivity low, so we need certain screening test to doubly verify whether a patient is COVID negative or not, because several asymptomatic patients are also contagious in terms of transmitting the disease. So HRCT is something we found even, even at some of our residents got admitted in the ICU, in the ward, and they have no symptoms and HRCT shows ground glass appearance, typical involvement uh, with the COVID, but they are doing well with the CQ azithromycin, they, got, they are recovering. None of them went on to uh, go on ventilator. And uh, it, it's generally said that, when do you consider the ventilator in this patient based on ABG, Dr. Mangala? Uh, if they're failing um, oxygen therapy and if they're still ex extremely hypoxemic or their work of breathing is, is going any up. Any level of uh, saturation that you like to say? If you can't maintain 88% with oxygen, then that would be the next step. Next step. Uh, if less than 88%, you will consider ventilator. And, and continuously, not just small drops that come uh, back up, but continuously less than Continuously. That. And yeah. how about the, have you tried the non-invasive ventilators? We did not in the beginning. We started to use it towards the end of the uh, New York experience. Uh, we were very concerned about aerosolizing. We didn't have any negative pressure rooms to use. So um, we started using high flow and non-invasive ventilation more towards in the last couple of weeks. And it, with good success in some patients, we found that patients who are requiring escalating doses of oxygen on either of those modalities will get intubated regardless. Absolutely, and uh, and another uh, point that I just wanted to understand that the uh, patients who are COVID positive and they are in the nasopharyngeal phase and you've started, suppose a remdesivir, have you tried remdesivir in all the patients? Not all the patients. We don't have unlimited amount of it. We have a, a tier system of who would benefit the most. The earlier you give it, the better. So then what, uh, what other drug do you use when you have a patient with a COVID positive? We're not really, we don't have any good medications, honestly. We're using tocilizumab if they're in cytokine storm. In some limited patients, we're using some steroids, but we don't have a good therapy. In remdesivir, we're giving to patients that was a, we only had that become available in the last three or four weeks. And that has been in patients who are early on in the disease that would benefit from it. What is your Once experience in, with uh, remdesivir? I haven't seen a lot of good um, outcomes of it, but by the time I see the patients, they're pretty far into ARDS. So I don't see them early on. So I don't have good good uh, anecdotal data for you on that. I did not see a benefit from hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin at all in our patients. Um, convalescent plasma, same thing. If you give it early, there's a possible benefit, but once they go into ARDS, we have not seen any difference from it at all. Uh, any benefit, but uh, ventilation with the proning, that, does that help in managing? Definitely, the... It definitely helps you oxygenate them um, and it buys you some time for the body to heal and for the lungs to stop being in the acute viral phase. So it, it, it allows you some time, which is what you need with this disease. 
and which antibiotic do you use? Then some antibiotic you need to use to prevent secondary infection? It depends on the patient and how long they've been intubated. Um, we did end up giving some to patients further on, but it, it, we don't have any really good treatments for this disease, unfortunately. Okay, and recovery rate? If they go on to be requiring a ventilator, the, um, the, the mortality is about 60% is what we find. If Absolutely. they don't require a ventilator, it's, it's obviously much better. Much better. Okay. Yeah. So that's all scenario that we can talk. Any point, uh, Ramesh, you would like to add? I, I think uh, one question to Puneet is about uh, uh, what about anticoagulation? Are you sending patients home as prophylaxis, actually? And uh, what sort of uh, prophylaxis are you using for these patients, Puneet? So unless they have documented um, uh, venous thromboembolism, pulmonary embolisms, or other uh, microemboli that have been diagnosed uh, from a standpoint of PA, PVD or other uh, um, or arterial emboli, we are not sending them home on any uh, anticoagulation uh, or even uh, aspirin at this time. I mean, I think the problem is there's no data. Um, we have considered uh, sending patients home on uh, aspirin, but uh, haven't really hasn't really panned out at this time, unfortunately. And about antiplatelet? Same thing. Uh, nothing uh, defined as of yet. Uh, I think it's been very individualized uh, on certain patients. If you've, uh, you know, it's it's a clin clinician based decision, but there's no protocols, at least not that I know of, that we've done uh, from a discharge standpoint. One question about uh, how do you do CPR uh, for Dr. Mangla or uh, uh, for me? How do you do CPR in these patients and how do you prevent aerosolization? So we use a HEPA filter on the AMBU bag if we're going to do um, uh, AMBU ventilation. Uh, and if we're doing, we really have tried not to do CPR if they've come to the point where they're in the ICU on a ventilator and then they go into cardiac arrest, the chances of them surviving that are very, very low. So we are, um, we did not do CPR in many of those patients that were in that, in that circumstance. Um, if we did do CPR because it was a sudden event and we were trying to understand what was going on, it was uh, with a HEPA filter on the AMBU bag. And about the intubation, is there any uh, is there any special technique for intubation? Do you use video laryngoscopy? We use video laryngoscopy for all of our intubations. So yes, we used it for this as well, but there was no special technique. We used N95. We used a uh, face shield, and um, we did the intubations. There was nothing special about them. But, but do you take them to the isolation room in the no. ICU? No. no. You do it in the on the routine bed? Correct. With the, with the video laryngoscopy? Correct. Okay. And we also created a, uh, um, a uh, intubation team as well. I think at least part of our uh, team was the anesthesiologists uh, that were obviously not... Uh, the ORs were not busy and other things. So we at South at one of our hospitals, we created a um, anesthesiology team, and they essentially went around. If you any if you, anyone needed to be coded, or sorry, anybody needed to be intubated, relatively electively, if you want to call it, they would be called up overhead. And then of course they were also part of the code teams as well, so they were respond just responding. So I think creation of teams is one of the biggest things that came out of this, uh, from what I saw, uh, being in the ICUs and just managing these patients. Uh, I think having direction from uh, your critical care team to really disseminate that knowledge all, all throughout the health system, which through Dr. Amangla we did, um, you know, having protocols was very, very helpful um, because I think so many things we don't know and you also don't want to be uh, uh, abusive of uh, meds that may or may not necessarily be helpful. So I think it was very helpful in having those uh, directions. Uh, so teams, the proning team, the intubation teams, the, um, you know, the critical care teams, I, I think that was really extremely beneficial. And especially for the next surge now, I think it'll be extremely helpful because now we learn from our experience, we're already uh, creating lists of people uh, who would be, uh, you know, called upon, uh, you know, on a more organized fashion uh, for the next phase of this, if necessary. Okay. Two short and about the DNR status? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
There is a question about DNR status. So, um, honestly, we were sort of in emergency phase for many, many weeks, and uh, we did not do the same things that we normally did in terms of um, family consent and permission for DNR. We sort of assessed the situation for each patient and what the chances of recovery were, and if doing CPR or intubation would actually help the patient, would benefit in terms of mortality. So things were a little bit different during this acute emergency um, epidemic versus normal times. But we made most of these patients who were already intubated and in multi-organ failure, their livers, their kidneys were failing. We made those patients uh, DNR because we could not do anything more to help them. Several uh, cardiologists from, uh, from India, those who have joined us uh, for this program, for this webinar, they are praising the presentation and the discussion both. Continuously, I am reading lots of comments about it and uh, really happy with having you guys. Extremely good uh, session that we had and lots of discussion in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of ICCU care and anticoagulation and of course the cath lab management, the PCI and the PAMIs and then repatriation and redeployment, all those things possibly that we can, you know, think we have, I think, discussed, but we have to also learn in the process simultaneously and keep on learning <laughs> till, we, uh, till we have yes, a proper yes. antidote or a, 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 a vaccine. And that uh, hope, with that hope that vaccine might come in early 2021, and uh, the world which is ravaged at the moment due to this pandemic will get some relief. Once the vaccine found to be effective in second phase, the production will start in India mainly for vaccine for everybody all over the world. So it's in the collaboration with the companies, US America and the India collaboration at the political level, at the highest level, and that will help uh, the world produce maximum vaccine in a quicker time so that large number of patients, a large number of individuals can be vaccinated. And I think vaccines, once it starts, it will be given uh, on priority basis to healthcare worker, elderly and the children, and then the younger people, I hope so. It works that way. And this is a brilliant session that we had. I'm going to share a screen. Uh, please hold on. This is the screen which I displayed that the world survives on hope. So keep the hope alive. That is the main thing that I thought we should get there. And uh, I thank you, all the faculty, panelists, and the participant who contributed to this uh, great webinar that we had on a pandemic COVID-19. Thank you very much. And I look forward to having another session with you in another two, three weeks, if you all agree. Is that fine? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Sure. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to clap for all of you and all the participants. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Puneet and Dr. Mangla. Thank you, guys. Thank, bye -bye. All, thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye, Dr. Bang. Bye-bye.